This is the Presta. Ow. Presta John 86, Lego. Slave laws in Virginia. In 1682, the slave code received additions. It was enacted that runaways who refused to be arrested might be lawfully killed. Slaves were forbidden to carry arms, offensive or defensive, or to go off the plantation of their masters without a written pass, like a passport, like a passport, or to lift a hand against a Christian, even in self-defense, like the popo, like the popo. The condition of slavery was imposed upon all servants, mm, everybody, whether Negroes, Moors, mulattoes, or Indians, brought into the colony, era, era, brought into the colony. It didn't say found here. <laughs> But if you were brought here, more Negro, mulatto. <laughs> but let's go. Whether converted to Christianity or not. So, yeah, you know, they were trying to put everybody, even the Indian, right? Of course, <laughs> the Nagas, they find it here. They try to convert them to Christianity. They try to, you know, put us into captivity, right? So now you were put into this slavery provided that you were not of Christian parentage or country. Or if you were a Turk or a Moor in amity with his majesty. Got it. So everybody's getting put into slavery, Indians, mulattoes, Moors, or Negroes, whether you converted or not. So you converting to Christianity didn't make you not a slave. You were still a slave. What made you not a slave is if you had, you know, Christian parents. <laughs> or came from a Christian country. Um... I guess if you were a Catholic, you would be considered a Christian. If you were, if you were a, <laughs> well, let's go, let's go, we'll get it. <laughs> Turk or more with amity. It was amity, man. Amity. Friendship, you were friendly, friendly, international amity, goodwill. Let's go. So you were going into captivity unless you were of Christian parentage or if you were a Turk or a Moor which is all to say, uh, with friendship with the king and queen, right? Treaties of pieces and friendship. Let's start kind of where it's all popping off at, because before we start really getting into more treaties, and this is very necessary, my Naga and Presta 86, because I want to approach the Presta flow. You know, we, we've been all in the Mongol flow, talking Karakatais and, you know, uh, you know, all these connections with these dynasties, these China. And I want to get back into that as well with the OASB, this, this deliverer called China. But we've been approaching, you know, Presta, you know, from this 
you know, Christian angle in a sense, you know what I'm saying? Coming with these letters, you know, this auto of freezing and what the Pope is writing back to the Prester and the Prester letter itself in 1165. Monaga, this is Prester 86. But now I want to approach this Prester flow really from an indigenous American perspective of what's happening and what appears to be one of the most pivotal, uh, pivotal, you know, um, power switches, you know what I'm saying? You have the 1200s and you got the 1700s equally pivotal back to the Templar. And, you know, what it really appears to be making sense from these timelines of chronology is that the 1200s are the 700s, you know, depending on whose timeline you're on. The 1200s are the seven, 1700s, Shalak. So, the 1700s and 1200s and this power switch, whether you're talking Prester and Genghis or, you know, these treaties right here, you know what I mean? Everything with the Kumse and, and this push Mataha, and, you know, all this, uh, you know, infighting, you know what I mean? All this title switching, you know, so let's approach Preston from an indigenous American perspective. And to do that, you got to pay attention to the more and more war something we've been talking about for over half a decade and digging on respectfully because everyone has their part to play. It's not nobody's fault that you got into captivity. It's between you and your creator, man, and, and what you keep it and what you ain't keep it. You know what I'm saying? What you are witnessing and what you're not witnessing, how we observe our code and how we're not observing our code. So this ain't no point to figure thing, which everybody should be able to respect. At the same time, man, we got to ask the right questions, man. We got to get through this investigation not non-biasedly, you know what I'm saying? And if we're going to tribe up again, it has to be an us. It has to be a tribe. And you know what I'm saying? It's going to take the help of all the tribes that have had anything to do with the erasing of our memory. We can take our responsibility, but you got to take yours and you got to help us put Humpty Dumpty back together again, man. Right now, we're waking up in the inner cities and the hoods near you, and we're asking the right questions, man. You know, without the trickery, who are we? We're not all one thing, one tribe. There's a more and more war taking place, going all the way back to this Kalelu situation. Solomon, the builder, told Texas, you know what I'm saying? Even before this Genghis Khan flow in the 1200s, we was, you know, going to war, even within ourselves in the 700s and left to Daniel Lowe with the Forbidden Histories of America. We have Theodorus Amari, Makir, Amari, Amari. That's in the 700s. So then you say, well, America's named after Al Morocco. We're talking 700s in America. Let's go. Let's go back to the beginning. <laughs> well, let's go a little deeper. Let's go a little deeper, man. Um, the Aaron Ben Gilead dot blogspot.com. Click the links. Let's go. In North America, there was a kingdom or empire which was west of the kingdom of Alagania in Appalachia. In the principality of Regia Alashia, <laughs> but east of the Kalelus kingdoms, okay. East of the Kalelus kingdoms, it's like East Coast, you know, you, you know, in, in the East Coast, America, East Coast, you know or east of it, you know, it could be some of the south as well. We're going to be talking a lot of Illinois, you know what I'm saying? We're going we're gonna to kick it back to the old school. I mean, we're going to do a lot of cool things in 86. I've been waiting for this. 84 and 85, you know, we had to de develop, you know, a little more foundation so we could just pop this off the right way. And now we're ready to do it all. Praise our, our creator, allow uh, a hey, shalom to the tribe. We popping off, man. Hey, it's all happening. 
Wow. So east of Kalelus, you got these principalities popping off. You got this kingdom popping off. Let's keep reading. This was the Davidic Amazon kingdom. Uh -oh. So we're about to get into the matriarchies. Now these are not your classic, what they want to, uh, you know, their version of matriarchies today is something that was like, anti-patriarchy you know what i'm saying anti-men or you know are we taking control uh women you know uh you know this beyonce who rule the world who rule the world no we ain't talk we talking about a balance man a balance that's been forgotten when we say hawa we bring back the balance our frame our shaper we give mama the existence that mama deserves you know we extol mama <laughs> as it says you know what i'm saying and uh and that was that Solomon, Saliman is popping off, you know what I mean? So, you know, we we extol mama, Proverbs chapter four, extol her. So let's bring the balance back. It's not about shifting the balance to this side and shifting it to that side. We are not at war with each other. Man and woman is not at war with each other. <laughs> we need each other more than ever right now. We don't need no barriers of separation between our sisters and our brothers our ox and our aqua so let's put it back together again we're putting everything back together in the press investigation this is our time where, where do we come from anage why are we popping off this way why are we asking these questions why are we speaking with such authority without going to their authoritative measures Let's go. So in North America, right? <laughs> there is a kingdom or empire, which was west of the kingdom of Alagania and Appalachia and the principality of Ragia, Alachia, and east of the Kalelus kingdoms. Okay, let's <laughs> meet somewhere in the middle. Let's go. This was a Davidic, the Davidic, Davidic, er, er, Davidic, Amazon, I know those two words don't normally go together, but you want to see clearly or not, my dog. We're talking North America. You're going to see how this all ties together. Only mama could bring these ingredients together and make the meal and cook it up. Love to not spiral. We cook it over here. Hey, up to the eye. We're talking meteors, we're talking Prestors, we're talking Davids, and we're talking Davidas, right? The Aquas, we're talking the, the Davidic Amazon queendom of Dodu or Kadodu, which reminds me of the Kado Indians, right? The Kado Indians. Kado? We keep we keep jumping around this Kado. <laughs> All right, so we know what Amazon Amity means all right, friendly. Okay, okay. I mean, we get definition. We're getting definition. What about these condos, man? Mm. Cotto, I mean, it's a whoa, it's a lot. It's a condo, Paris, Louisiana, Texas. There's a lake, a river in Arkansas. Cotto tribe, Cotto nation. <laughs> Cotto confederacy, they're bringing it into Oklahoma. There's a whole Cotto language. You know, we, we, we've, we've connected with Cotto before and it seems like it, you know, has that vibration of the Shikamagua. It seems like it has the vibration of these Hebrew, Hebrew root knockers original to this land. The Cotto Confederacy was a network of indigenous people. Southeastern woodland. So they just said, you know, say east of Kalelus, right? So, whoa. 
historically inhabited much of what is now East Texas, East, right? West Louisiana, but it's East, but it's not that East. You're talking Texas, Oklahoma, Arkansas, Louisiana, East of Kalalus, East of Cali, <laughs> but still West of, you know, New Jersey, you know, we're going to talk New Jersey, <laughs> you know what I'm saying? West of, uh, you know, East. You know what I mean, so prior to European contact, they were the Cadoan Mississippi culture who constructed huge earthwork mounds. <laughs> Can you say pyramids, man? What are we talking about? At several sites in the territory, flourishing 800 to 1400. 800. Let's go back. We're talking. Cotto. We're talking to Cotto Mississippian culture, right? They they talking 800. Prehistoric Native American Native American culture considered by archaeologists as a variant of the Mississippian culture. Back to the Cotto languages. Ah, okay, okay. A lot to dig on this Cotto. I mean, we keep bouncing around it, but they're bringing up this Cotto dude. whose queen and her elite Jewish woman ruled Jewish women. So this queen and her aquas, which are Jewish women, or we're talking Hebrews, because my naga. Let's just skip down in here. The queen was known as Davida or Dode or Doda, and often in the second to fifth century intermarried with the Judah, Ramani, when they say Roman, they're talking promised land, Ramah. So they marry, intermarry with the kings of Judah, of Kalelus. So when they talk matriarchy, <laughs> these are like Amazon queen, Wonder Woman, super warriors like you've seen in like Black Panther, man. And they still had babies with, <laughs> with the kings of Judah. Remani of Kalelus, we're talking North America. We're not talking Rome, white Rome in Italy, what's been painted in the pictures and put on a movie screen. I'm talking the Rema. The promised land, pomegranate Nagas. Hebrew, word of the day. Hebrew, Rema, pomegranate, my Naga. I don't even got to type it in. They already know we come. Word of the day. <laughs> I mean, you can see it right here, man. We, we we going quick, but when they get Roman, they're getting it from the word Rema. Rema, pomegranate, contains the Hebrew blessing, we say, before eating fruit that grows on a tree. <laughs> yeah, Rema or Rema, Hebrew for both pomegranate and grenade, because, you know, we blowing stuff up with these fireballs, man. So stop playing with us when we talk Rama. They're talking Roma. All that is connected. All that is connected to Hashra to Israel. All that is connected, literally head of the of the year. American Jews say Apple. We're talking pomegranate, Rama, Hebrew for pomegranate, Rama, Rama, Rama. Red man, here we all day. <laughs> Back to Israel and the 12 Nagas that had to survey, make sure that the promised land was all clear. Got, got the pomegranates, brought them back to prove they was in the Reman, the, prome, the pomegranata. So pomegranata is always synonymous with Israel because pomegranata is pomegranate. Pomegranate is Reman, promised land. You have to Prove you were in the promised land with the pomegranate. 
So when they jack the title, they're saying that we the people of the promised land, pomegranate, we the Rimon, we the Roman. I mean, that's the quick look at it, but go get the drop if you really want to get the <laughs> get the digging. So the queen, let's let's back it up. Let's back it up. Let's back it up. North America. God, God. Or we just talking Asia, but let, let's go. East of Kalalus, east of Kalalus, but not too east, you know, still west of the kingdom of Appalachia or Allegheny. Davidic Amazon queen, Dodu, Kado, Kado, who's queen and her elite Israelite women. Ruled over different tribes in the area of Arkansas, Mississippi, and surrounding areas. The Cherokee people today descended from this Judah, Judeo, Reman, 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 Hebrew for pomegranate. Amazon. <laughs> so that's how you connect Judah or Udall <laughs> with the title connecting Udall, the promised land, the four corners, Amazon, South America, elite ruling group. Because you're the head, not the tail. And at this time, we're talking second to fifth century on their calendar. Your Morocco ain't set up in America in the second century, fifth century. We're going to talk about this, man. Because they're going to tell on themselves, and it makes our question, you know, it validates, you know, the reason we're asking this, man. You know, what happened during the Tecumseh War? Were these treaties on these Nagas from tribes that already were here, already, you know, jealous of what's happening with these strong Israelite tribes under Tecumseh, under the Shikamagua, that's still thriving no matter what the invasion. Our power gave us so much power, man. We were still strong and, and, and elite. It took confederacy after confederacy and treaty after treaty not to fight the white man, but to slay the dragon of India Superior, the Preston. All this is going down here. You got to ask yourself the question. Whose side were you on? Why was a treaty necessary? Why was teaming up with the hijack necessary? Unless you're saying they ain't the hijack, which, which really got us looking at you funny. If you're saying the people you made treaties with are not the hijack, you still don't see that to this day, then man, you confuse. And ain't nothing worse than a confused con. This is our investigation into us. And yeah, it's involving you because of these treaties. Without the treaties, it wouldn't involve you. But because of the treaties, we digging it up and we putting a magnifying glass on your ass. You can't even say Morocco was popping off in America during this time of Kalelus and these aquas, these sisters that's marrying these kings to protect the land and they were ruling, the queens and the ruling Israelites, not Jewish elite. <laughs> they talking about the kingdom of Israel, the seeds of the creator, not the Islamic seeds of this and this and that. They practice their own form of Judaism. Well, that's not Islam. <laughs> we talking second century. So Judaism did not exist. That's why they say their own form 
Oh, you mean they kept the cold? They kept the ancient ways, the ancient love song, while the other tribes in the empire of queendom remain pagan. Oh, you mean they're still walking around these cubes and throwing stones? So just like with David, they paid tribute to David, just like they did to Vita. <laughs> David is a title. Davida is the same title. You're holding down that function, whether you are aqua or ah. And these aquas were holding it down specifically in Arkansas, Mississippi, and those surrounding areas, man. Where's Queen, you know, Sheba coming out of, man? You know, where's Queen Khalifa popping off? They always claiming her, right? <laughs> but nah, man, she's already a ruling elite. She's an high Amazon queen. She ain't part of this pageantry, pageantry, faking royals, faking rulers, faking greats. This queen ruled over a number of Amazon duchesses. Oh, you don't remember this empress? You want to talk about y'all empresses, but you don't want to remember these high Amazon queens? The queens of Judah? The Remani? The Rema? The Rema? Yeah, the Pomegranata. We're talking Granada, right? You don't want to talk Granada? Managa, you don't want to talk Pomegranata? Right now, we got to, you know, we got to slow it on down sometimes, man. I mean, we're talking about Remani, fertility. We got to be talking to Aquas, you know what I mean? So I love this investigation because we just bring it all back to the forefront. We don't, we don't let them just talk, you know, uh, from one perspective. You know, we got to make sure it always comes back home. Everything we're doing, got to connect, man. It got to come back home. Or else what are we doing it for? And we give Ahab to our aquas because our aquas are popping off. Allow what? So let's get it. Cool. You know. All right, good, good. Just had to get situated, man, because uh, we popping up. <laughs> so let's go, man. I mean, The queen ruled over a number of Amazon duchess. The duchess of the Gentile or pagan clans were known as the Gekwa, Gekwa, the war woman. Over four distinct tribal groups of maternal A, B, C, and D, maternal DNA. The term Ada Ge Yuda for beloved woman by the Cherokees today was originally a title of the queen and originally the Gavira Ha. Yoda, Yudi, or Judy, or Judah, the believe, or excuse me, beloved queen mother of the Jews, Hebrews. The Jewish Duchess of TXJUH and I mitochondria DNA were known as Isha Ha Doda, Yudi, beloved woman of the Jews, the Judah, the royal clan of the Hebrews. So they can get into their 
mitochondria DNAs, you know what I mean? But all they're doing is saying the same thing. You know, these are the royals. These are the American royals of Kalelus. These particular aquas, you know, that were married, intermarried with the kings, the Ramani, Judah, the kings of Judah, the kings of Kalelus, back to the Toteks, Totecas, Israel the first, Israel the second, the Makirs, you know, all these titles, all these clans coming out of Israel in that time. You know, these are the royals. This is all we're talking about. You know, whether we get it from this perspective or that perspective, this is really all we're, conf we're uh, you know, confirming. Now, dig it on this, man. All right, let's get it. So the original Choctaw had a mainly maternal Mitochond a mitochondrial haplogroup. The, Ch the Chickasaw were mainly B mitochondria DNA, maternal origin. The original Muscogee were D mitochondria DNA origin. And there was a group among the Cherokee we called the pagan Cherokee that were mainly of C. The X mitochondria DNA clan is the oldest Hebrew clan now why do you think they're called the x clan man what what's with this x this x marks the spot you know what i'm saying that makes them the oldest the ogs what about this x clan man and these indians right it would seem that a branch of royal amazon queens of t2 mitochondrial dna moved back to europe and intermarried with the noble royal houses so that it would seem, man, they're they're now, you know, having a hypothesis. They, you know that they're just guessing, so they have no idea. <laughs> it would seem that this happened and that happened to get this. I just say I don't know. T mitochondrial DNA descends from Nehushta, the queen mother of Judah. Oh, we're not saying we're not saying Jew no more. Oh, it was the Jewish Cherokee clan. Have you heard of a Jewish Cherokee clan? <laughs> Managa, this is Judah. They just told you this is Judah. Now, not all Cherokees are Judah, but you know, all Judah would be considered under the Cherokee or the Karaka banner. But so would the Moabite tribes and these other tribes, you know what I'm saying? They would also be considered under the banner, you know what I'm saying, which is where they're getting this infighting. And how you get to the Shikamagua, who made no treaties because they're the Cherokee that didn't want to make no treaties. You know what I'm saying? Let's get it from here, man. Okay. You know, I love this because, you know, it gives us a lot of drop into you know, specific queens, you know what I'm saying? So you got Dodi the first, the Vida, David, the queen of Ka Dodu, AKA Lady David or Lady Davida of Avalon. So she's popping it off. What is she, uh, a part of the Morocco more sciences? <laughs> or are you just talking about the Israelites right here at home? Oh, she migrated with some Romans. She was part of uh, the conversion into Judaism. You're talking 52. Ain't this around the time of JC? <laughs> in America, there's a, you're talking about Queen David. Is, <laughs> it's right here in America. What, 20 years after JC died? Come on, man. We got, we got some questions to answer, man. Let's go. She was the first Davidic Judeo Romani Roman Amazon war warrior woman. They saying she's the first war woman. She she's the first Wonder Woman, right? Of the Cado Cado Du Queendom in the area of pre-Columbian Arkansas, Mississippi, and surrounding areas. She was the first of Gilead, first daughter of Gilead Ben Joseph. <laughs> come on man come on man they went back on us they talking about joseph 
Are they talking about the Joseph? You know what I'm saying? Who, you know, rose up to be, you know, Khan of of Mitzrayim at that time, Egypt at that time, you know what I'm saying? So, so jo- you know, Joseph was royalty for the Hebrews, you know what I'm saying, as well as in Egypt, you know what I mean? So she's supposed to be the daughter of Joseph. <laughs> I mean, you know, where else would she be getting all this power to be this war woman, right? Well, let's go, let's go. And this also shows you that this David title goes back a long way. And it was used by the Ox and the Aquas. They would be, you know, the Presters as well. You know what I'm saying? They intermarried. Sheba was the match of Solomon. And he wasn't, you know, they were they were equal. You know, it was it was a it was an equal pop offness with the pure water understanding, man. You know what I'm saying? So she was a daughter of Gilead, being Joseph, Gilead's son of Joseph, or Joseph of Gilead. You know what I mean? But if it's Gilead, the son of Joseph, then that would make, you know, Joseph like her, her dad or stepdad. You know what I mean? Either way. Now it says Josephus, George Josiah. Is, is this Josephus? <laughs> I mean, <laughs> Galia, Galaha, Fisher King of Avalon. Remember them Fisher Kings? This is why we get into the romances. The son of St. Joseph of Arimathea and his wife, Nisia, Nisia, Nair, Bat, Nathaniel. And the, uh, the daughter of Nathaniel Bar, Tolme, Prince of Kalelus, a.k.a. St. Bartholomew. And his wife, Princess Salome of Kalelus. Now, the inner BCs. She married Solomon Sylvanus, Tolma, or Tolteca. Well, we just talked about Solomon, the builder, Sylvanus, Toltexas, the king of Kalelus, born in 50 AD, who died 120. What timelines are we on? Either way, you predate a lot of this wing wham coming out of, you know, this is Morocco business. It was it Morocco then? If America's named after Al Morocco, <laughs> was it Morocco during this Kalelus period that goes back to the BCs? Huh? Was it Morocco during Shalom? of Kalelus in 5 BC, where they walking around cubes. King of Kalelus, was he a Moroccan king of Kalelus? Was Kalelus all about Islam in Morocco? Man? Where, does, where does Judah fit in? Is Judah a part of the Moorish empire? Who was the press to fight and what, which sultans were paying the press to Presta John tribute. Uh, was he also paying them tribute? Or was he the Rex Negus? His queens held that title. The kings held that title. You come from the royals, but they put you to sleep, put you in a black hole and say, if you want to be special, come through our, you know, our path. Their prophet did it for them. Their prophet noble did it for them. Anyone else that wanted to, you know, um, walk that path, but that's not the path. It wasn't your path. It was a path that came with peace and friendship. Peace and friendship treaties that was around before the prophet noble was born. He's coming in, you know, using these treaties, using what he can, you know, rallying his people, right? Getting his flag up. Not for Israel, but not, again, not for Judah. I mean, yeah, you, you can find, you know, if you want to get down with the citizenship of America, maybe you can get a path. But if you want your shit back, it wasn't for that. 
she's followed by Dode or Davida. So anytime you see Dode, D-O-D-E, it's David. <laughs> David. Of Kalelus, Judea, Rema, Roma, Amazon, Queen of Kadodu. All right. So you got everyone's drop. And you can look at all these David Queens. <laughs> They're not just popping off, you know, now they say of Avalon, and they said they're around this Arkansas. So Avalon and all that must be around Arkansas, Mississippi, all that. You know, these timelines are trippy, right? Because this is 50, 100, you know what I'm saying? You know, this is <laughs> OG drop now. Could we add a thousand years onto this? You know, which, you know what I mean? Because that'll bring us right really in the mix of things with the Dark Ages. You know what I mean? Did they push this back a thousand years too? Mm. Solomon Sylvanus. Again, these are titles. These are titles. So amazing drop. Let's go. I, I'm just really bringing our attention to... <laughs> how things hit so close to home. And just looking at it from this line right here, the Cherokee people today descend from this Judeo-Roman Amazon elite rolling, uh, ruling group, as well as some of the pagan Indian uh, Ishmaelites. Whoa, whoa, I didn't say it. I didn't say it, but we're talking a more and more war, right? Talking about the migration of Ishmael. They they brought up Ishmael, not me. They're calling it pagan. And they're highlighting these so-called Jewish, which we know there ain't no Jewish at that time of 2 AD or 200 AD or second century. That shit ain't invented yet. Ain't no conversion to Judaism before this King Balan, Bulan and 700s and, you know, 800s and all that stuff. So that's when that started, but this predates that. But this tribe of Ishmael migration, don't. And if you really look at it closely, this is just them making an annual migration. Yeah, that's what we really got to start, you know, recognizing. This is an annual migration. <laughs> This is them making pretty much their hodge. You know, they're migrating in, you know, meeting up by this white river, all the Indians, <laughs> Indianapolis, all right. <laughs> and they start to make their hodge. And to make their hodge, they got to go right past this tip of canoe where their treaties cause so much slaughter of Israel. They're making a holy mountain treaty where Israel was slaughtered, right? <laughs> Through that to this, you know, new Morocco situation popping off until they get to this con key, con key. Now, we're going to get some con key for the dismount, but why would their migration stop right before the con key river? All right, so it starts right before the river. This is like a demarcation. They're pretty much crossing over the Wabash, which, you know, they got a bunch of dams, you know, now. I wonder why. The whole flow is different now, you know what I mean, all these dams. But they come, they migrate. So from the spring, they're migrating this way. In the summer, they're migrating this way. And then they fall and migrate out. So you're telling me. If this is a whole year's worth of you migrating, <laughs> you know what I mean? Or you, you just migrate, you fall back, and then you start migrating. You know what I mean, either way, you coming in and you coming right back out the way you can. We're talking about a cube, right? Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. We're we going to 
<laughs> hey man, we've been surfing the wave and press it, John. For a minute, man. <laughs> we've been doing it, man. And hey, I, my baby girl, my daughter I be, man. You know what I'm saying? She's been right here with a knocker, man. I appreciate you, baby aqua. And you've been all the way with a knocker too, man. All oh, this is that work y'all been putting in, man. Anybody ask you what y'all been doing over here, you could just say, hey, look, surf the wave. You know, and this is just a portion of our overall investigation, you know, that we have included in the Preston John investigation. You know, we got the flat drop. We got all this other indigenous drop in between. And, you know, of course, you know, frequency drop. And we always in the cold and, you know, we keep it balanced, man. But it's all that happened, man. It's, it's all that popping, man. It's all happening, man. But, yeah, you know, get that 87 or, excuse me, get that 85. <laughs> we on 86. Yeah, I mean, and just keep surfing the wave. Hey, how to drop nation. Yeah, we're just talking about a cube. Don't mind us, because I'm not calling it a cube. I don't have to. They are calling it a cube, right? Harmonics cube. This is the holy mountain of Harmonics cube of Ishmael. They keep throwing Abraham in this so they can get some, some vouching, but this is Ishmael's thing, man. This is Ishmael's thing. It's the cube, right? So something about this circling patterns and all the stuff they're doing, it's because there is or was the cube right here. Is or was, I don't know. Is it buried? Is it underwater? Is it still there? I don't know. Y'all, y'all ask the question. <laughs> we out of here. So they're doing like a hodge around this cube. You know what I'm saying? Uh, the cube represents the earth and platonic solids. And, you know, that's when you're getting deeper, and, you know, circle in the square or square in a circle. This looks more like a triangle. <laughs> you're more doing a triangle, you know, over the cube. You know what I mean? But either way, you know, that, that circle is like representing the universe. So it's like the earth and then they're the universe, you know, and, you know what I mean? They have their ways, man. Right. So, I heard that Cairo is always on is, is also on this map. So if you could find Cairo, man, I might have a, a prize for you. So I've been looking for Cairo on there. Let me know if you see Cairo. Yeah. Okay. So they stop at the Kankaki River, head all the way down. And, you know, most of this is Indiana territory. You can also consider, I guess, Illinois. But we're talking about pagans. Not because I'm saying pagan. Because <laughs> they're saying pagan. So these Cherokee people, our people, are many people. You have Israel in there, you got Moab in there, you got Ishmael in there, right? So everyone's keeping this title. So when you try to claim Cherokee today, it's already been pretty much taken <laughs> with all these other tribes claiming this Cherokee flow, right? But Cherokee, some would say just means we the people. I would say it connects more to Karakatai, which is the black Nagas of Cathay. Cathay is you know, promised land, pure land. So, you know, it's, it's melanated nagas of, of a pure land. And at the end of the day, all this is about land. It's about Judah. It's about the Ramani, the pomegranate, the pomegranate, the Amazon naga, you know what I'm saying? The indigenous naga, but these ruling, this ruling nagas, you know, as well as some pagan Nagas, which they put in parentheses, Ishmaelites are all under this Cherokee banner. So they're calling, based on this perspective, Israel, or excuse me, Ishmael, pagans. And are we catching them in any pagan tree, pageantry, making their loop-de-loops? 
around this holy mountain of harmonics cube. Anything pagan to do with the gods, the powers that these tribes are serving. We have a lot of documentation in the script about these, you know, gods, these Baals and Baaluses, and I'm gonna get some, I'm gonna get some 2016 drop to connect some of this as well, you know, just let you know <laughs> where we started at, you know, digging on some of this, but you know, I mean, just keep all this going, man, because it's cray cray how it all connects. I mean, you really, honestly, you got to get, I mean, to really understand this, man, you, you kind of got to go back, man, right? To, back to the script, Psalms 83, right? Because hold not your peace a while. Your enemies are in an uproar. They that hate you have lifted up their head. They hold crafty converse against your people. They take counsel against your treasured ones they have said come and let us cut them off from being a nation that the name of Hasharah be no more in remembrance for they have consulted together with one consent against you do they make a covenant a what a covenant a what a treaty We've been talking 1786, pieces of friendship. But this is one of the most game-changing treaties of all time. All time. They make treaties, covenants with one consent. Against your treasured one. You see, they would be pagans because Hawa only knew one family, right? Right? You remember that? Amos 3? These other tribes at this time in America, in Kalelus, invading Kalelus, these other tribes, they didn't know Hawa. Amos 3, hear the word that Hawa has spoken against you, O children of Israel. Who? Asherah. Asherah, right? the children of Israel, the children of Hawa. Against the whole family which I brought up out of Egypt, man. I know the whole crew. I know the aunts, the uncles. I know the cousins. I know the whole family. I know you. I don't kick it with them. I'm the power. And I raised you up. I'm the power. I'm the power of Abraham. I'm the power of Adam. I'm the power of Moshe. O children of Israel, against the whole family which I brought up out of Egypt, saying, you only have I known of all the families of the earth. I need you to get that through your mind bone might bake your noodle to know that of all these tribes we're talking about, of all the tribes that the Konse couldn't get the tribe up with him to fight the final war, the final battle. Because after that, it was, it, was, it, it was kaputs, man. It was over with. All those tribes he tried to tribe up with, they had their own hesitations that uh, they had covered his hearts. They had jealousies, they had envy because they did not know Hawa. It's hard to tribe up with people that have different powers. That's what I say. Can two walk together unless they agree. You want to tribe up with us today, but we don't agree with the power you know, that we are connected to. We rock with the creator of the earth, man. Nothing in between it, nothing to the side. We don't, we're not told to throw stones and walk around cubes and do all these extra things and go into this Arabic corrections situation where these Hebrews don't need an Arabic 
correction. And these Hebrews don't need an Arabic prophet. They need a prophet out of Judah where the scepter never departs. If you're not giving these tribes of Judah a prophet out of Judah, it's blasphemy to them. Because we always know that we come out of us, that our loins rises, rises, our people, our shepherd comes out of us, is us. We don't have to go to another tribe for guidance. We have it within us. You need guidance from us. We don't need guidance from outside tribes unless you truly are here to give us the Ahab within the code of our creator. But if you ain't within the code of our creator, we don't need your guidance. Fall back and keep your secrets. You see us coming, man. It ain't one man, it ain't one aqua. It's all of us, man. Will two all together except they agree? You want to try about with us? You want to try about with me? Can two all together except they agree that we got one creator? One code to keep? That we don't make no deals with the devil. But you want to validate that in 2022 and act like that shit was cool? That wouldn't be cool today. But it would happen today. If a Naga prophet raised up and said, hey, leave your jobs and, and you know, believe in the creator and, and separate, get out the cities, man. You would call him a cult leader, man. Some would support, many won't. But that Naga would need to connect to no other tribes. That Naga got a tribe. That tribe that that Naga is from, Israel, the whole family, Hawa got us, Hawa brought us out of Egypt, out of bondage the first time. And we only, you only have I known of all the families <laughs> of earth. It's plain and simple. This is not the God of earth, of, uh, of all earth people. This is the creator and power of these families. And this is why they mad, son. This is why they jealous. And this is why they want the pomegranate. <laughs> this is why they want that crown top fruit. This is why they want the promised land. This is why they want to be called Romans or Remas. Pagan. American Indian Ishmaelites. This is who's migrating on your head bone during the treaties that are popping off everywhere, all over this map. Fort Wayne is right here. Think it's play play. I know, I know. Fort Wayne, Fort Wayne Moray, Wabash Moray, Wabash River, Morocco, Kankaki, Tippecanoe, Tippecanoe. Oh, the tribe of Ishmael is very good at music. Well, well I'll be. <laughs> Thank you, man. Appreciate that. It's, it's like an Ishmael pamphlet, man. Does your music have anything to do with the Holy Mount of Harmonics? I'm just talking about the tribe of Ishmael migration, who they're calling pagans because of the idolatry. Walking around a cube is a form of worship, not to Hawa. Throwing stones at Saturn and Mars is a form of worship, Mercule's worship, not Hawa. Mecca. This is their Hajj. This is their 
<laughs> this is their holy mountain, man. But was it here in the days of Kalelus? The Davidic Amazon kingdoms, the Judean Ramon kings of Kalelus. While other groups such as the Kato, Choctaw. Oh, then we just say Kato? That's crazy. Because we're talking about Kadodu. Right. <laughs> and they throw Kato out there. And we was talking about the Kado and Mississippi culture. And we're talking Mississippi because they're talking Mississippi. I can't make this stuff up. Dig it on this with you, Kado. Kado and Kado, Mississippi, right? Considered by archaeologists as a variant of the Mississippian culture, the Kadoan Mississippians cover a large territory, including eastern Oklahoma, western Arkansas, northeast Texas, northwest Louisiana, United States. Yeah. Okay. So the Kado, the Choctaw, and the Chickasaw were under the queen's rule and authority. This is why they mad, son. Because these Hebrew Israelites, these queens and kings of Judah, they were in an elite royal status. You know what I'm saying? They weren't in no American citizenship Moorish state nation status, they were an elite Ibaru status because they're the head and not the tail by default. Because you only have I known of all the families of the earth, my naga. So they're the head and not the tail. They're the elites. Because you only have I known of all the families of the earth, my naga. You only have I known. Therefore, I will punish you because you ain't listening. I will visit you for your iniquities. This is why we got that work. And while we were getting that work, they were getting that work in. Come and let us cut them off from being a nation. So the name of Israel is no more in remembrance. For they have consulted together with one consent. Against you, do they make a covenant? A what? A treaty. Treaties. Call them out by name, man. Let's connect it. <laughs> this is the press to out. Tend to eat um, Ishmaelites, right? Moab, Hagrigites, Gabal, Ammon, Amalek, Philistia, and on and on. We're talking children of Lot, but let's stay focused on Ishmael, man. Because it's really, you know, we're talking about everybody, but for now, let's just stay focused on Ishmael, man. Now, on the same map, you know, they got some things, and you got to get the babies out the bath water when they're talking about the Ben Ishmael tribe out of Ohio Valley. Settlements in Illinois, early 19th century, gave no further information about that name. All right, so this person dug around, got some drop, got it, got it. Ben Ishmael, let's just skip right here, were a collective of thousands of runaway slaves. Okay. <laughs> so they're saying they're not us. They're not indigenous to America, but they're running away from what? Let's go. Native Americans, poor whites, created a colony, a nomadic colony in the Kentucky Hills. This is actually a very important piece right here, Kentucky. They lived far from settlement communities and were forced out of the inhabitants, inhabited lands at a regular pace. So the story's not adding up, right? Because while they're making treaties and Treaty of Fort Wayne giving them what they say, 30 million acres of land. Now, it's not going directly to 
Ishmael, right? Because it's really going to the hijack, the, the hijack, hijack. But they are also the hijack, hijack because they're making the treaties. But you know what I'm saying? It's going, you know, to the straight up, you know, European, whatever you want to call it. You know what I'm saying? So, but they're still getting broken off. But some of them are, are kind of in limbo. They're not really fully trying to sell everything out and yada, yada. But they're falling in between. And it's hard to trust the devil when you make a deal with the devil. And, you know, some of them are even getting pushed out by some of these devils that they made treaties with. And they're kind of misplaced. They have poor whites, of course, because all these whites, so-called whites, were poor. They had no royal lands. They're looking for gold. So these looking for gold whites, these turncoat natives, <laughs> are gathering in Kentucky. Just keep it, uh, let's just keep, you know, stay focused. Kentucky farmlands became slave farms. They moved to Cincinnati, Ohio. From Cincinnati, they were driven out, tracing a settlement pattern through Indiana, and finally to various small towns in Illinois. Cities like Muhammad, Mecca, Morocco, and Cairo bear the names of some of these settlements. So. You can find Kairos, different Kairos in America. I didn't see it on that map yet, but it's interesting. They remain nomadic in nature. They're 350 mile triangular migration route. So they migrated annually. Because <laughs> this is an annual migration. 350 mile triangular migration route stretch northwest from Indianapolis to the Kankakee River, south of Lake Michigan, through eastern Illinois, Urbana, Champaign, Moray, and Decatur, and finally due east back to Indianapolis. They make an entrance in James Fenimore Cooper's 1872 novel, The Prairie, as the family of a man called Ishmael Bush, though the tribe is mostly white in the book. Yeah, okay. Kentucky, right. <laughs> so Ben Ishmael, they start gathering, they form a colony in Kentucky, right? 1790. Very interesting. 1790, you know what I mean? It's right in the midst, right in the midst of the Chicamagua War, right? Chicamagua, the band of Cherokees under Dragon Canoe made no deals. They said no treaties. Tecumseh takes the reign. Before that is the Treaty of Fort Wayne. Around 1809, they say no major war because they're making treaties, right? Which leads to Tecumseh's war. So it's all war. It's all war. All right, back to 1790, Kentucky, right? <laughs> Come on, man, follow me now. Kentucky, 1790. Okay. Oh, there we go. War of 1812 in Kentucky's wrong. Right? Kentucky Hill, 1790. Tribe of Ishmael. Let's just put this together. Ishmael, Kentucky, <laughs> 1790. Let's just stay focused. 1790, Chicago. So it's all happening. Here comes Ishmael, 1790, Kentucky. Ishmael, got it. War of 1812. Often called the United States Forgotten War. I wonder why they don't really teach it like that, right? They don't teach nowhere near the truth about what popped off with you. The War of 1812 left an indelible mark on our nation's history. Kentuckians played a very or a vital role and paid dearly for it. 64% of Americans killed in the war 
were Kentuckians. Kentucky life followed the trail of Kentucky soldiers who fought in the war. All right, man, come on, let's, let's get to the drop. Kentucky was the site of continuing warfare between, and let's decode this, between settlers and Native Americans. Okay. <laughs> Slow down. <laughs> who's these settlers and who's the Native Americans you're talking about on both sides of the war? That's how they taught it to us, right? <laughs> settlers and Indians. Nah. The settlers in Kentucky are Ishmael. Let's just be clear. <laughs> Let's be clear. Ishmael is migrating. 1785. 1785, Ishmael is migrating. 1790, they're in Kentucky. Settling, right? It's a war between the settlers and the Native Americans. Well, who's fighting these Kentuckians? Who's fighting these settlers? In 1790, oh, the Shikamak, Northwest Indian War. Let's keep reading. Settlers and Native Americans who were backed by the British. So the American, Native Americans backed by the British. Oh, well, that's the Kumsay side of things because, you know, they did everything they could to fight against these so-called Americans. They bound together with all the Nagas they could across whatever waters. <laughs> the British were not, you know, what they made. It. It's just like they demonized these Brits because this wasn't no white British. You know, these were still Israelite family that was already tribed up and fighting in them areas over there. So the ones coming over here, the ones that, you know what I'm saying, were, you know, able to make these alliances, even though, it proved, you know, not to even be enough, man. But, you know, all of them was trying to stop what happened from happening. And we all know what happened, man. And you tell me, oh, alternate history, if this other side won, where would we be? Where would we be? You know what I'm saying? What would be, you know, the reality if the Kumsay and the tribes, you know what I'm saying, had you know, fought these settlers and won. But it wasn't our time to win. We had been winning. We, were, we, we, we had been elite, my night. So what would have happened, you know, doesn't even matter. Because we hear now. The Kentuckians were eager to fight. And Lexington's Henry Clay was a leader of the Warhawks in Congress. Okay, okay. Six congressmen from Kentucky fought in the war. People who voted in the war actually followed up their vote, fought in the war. Some of them died, said James Clotter, PhD, state historian in Kentucky. Leading men into the battle were William Henry Harrison, governor of Indiana. William Henry Harrison was also... Uh, Principal chief of the Choctaw Nation, right? And his mama is the daughter of Israel Garland, son of Silas Garland, son of John Garland the first. who's the son of Major James Garland, who is the husband of Hushiyukpa. And Hushiyukpa is the sister of Pushmataha. <laughs> and as the sister of Push, 
they both are the son and daughter of the sun mythical and the moon mythical or father choctaw mother choctaw father choctaw mother choctaw have who she and push and who she is married into the james garland family and these garlands well james garland <laughs> was a regular a regular army member distinguished for 50 years of service 1812 is the war he's known for he's killed so many seminoles shikamawa cherokees he's fought in the utah war what does the utah war have to do with the utah war what does the mexican war have to do with the utah war what is the shim Shem War, Shemino War have to do with the Mexico, Mexican, Moshe War have to do with the Utah, Judah War have to do with the the Tecumseh War of 1812. John Garland has everything to do with all this stuff. And this is who the sister of Push marries. So letting you know it's hijacked one-on-one -on -one from the top, tippity top. Because their son, James Garland, Samuel Garland, all these, you know what I'm saying, um, you know, become venerated within this Choctaw nation, man. Silas Garland <laughs> has a son named Israel, all right? And, uh, yeah, they have a daughter named Louise. All these Garlands. And now they have a bloodline, a maternal bloodline, back to Push, back to Choctaw. So all these so-called whites are now claiming this Choctaw lineage, and they have a legit Choctaw lineage that connects all the way to Push Mataha, the sister of Push, man. And Louise is the mama of Henry. Harrison, <laughs> principal chief of the Choctaw. And there's another Henry Harrison that's coinciding with this investigation as well, who's also President William Henry Harrison, who was governor and is also known as Old Tippecanoe. And Managa, we just talking Tippecanoe, right? Come, come, come. We just talking Tippecanoe, right? where they're migrating, making their annual migration. That's a long migration they got to make, right? 350 miles. So I guess you make some in the spring, some in the summer, some in the fall. Wow. Okay. But we know these Ishmael lights are connected with Kentucky. In 1790, in the heat of the Chickamauga War. <laughs> the War of 1812 has everything to do with the Kentuckians and the settlers, which, you know, is a guise for these tribes that look just like you. But you would never know that these settlers look just like you, would you? That when we talk settlers, we're talking the Ishmaelite tribes, right? And they're being led into battle by William Henry Harrison, principal chief of the Choctaw at this time, governor of the Indiana Territory, as well as Isaac Shelby, who was serving his second term as the governor of Kentucky. Now, I, I ain't even got to bring up the Kumse. They have to speak the Kumse, right? Because that's why we speak. We, it's a pivotal time, this 1800s. Very pivotal, just like the 1200s with Genghis Khan, right? And Preston John. So is it all one thing? Let's go. It's the Preston Howard, man. Another faction in the conflict was a confederation of numerous Native American tribes formed to block American expansion. Who would be these numerous Native American tribes that are blocking American expansion? Who would be these numerous American tribes? Well, we do know. What we do know is that when we talk Shikamagua, 
right? You talking about the group that separated from the greater body of Cherokee during the American Revolutionary War. The majority of the Cherokee people wished to make peace with the Americans near the end of the of 1776. And when they made that treaty of peace, now you have 1790 where these Ishmaelites are gathering in Kentucky, right? Okay. They wish to make peace, but these Nagas didn't want to make no peace with the hijack. They rocking with Dragon Canoe. They fighting, getting pushed back, become the lower Cherokee, established the five lower towns. Man, then you got it all happening. During the, the winter of 1776 to 1777, Cherokee followers of Dragon Canoe, who had supported the British at the outbreak of the American Revolutionary War, moved down, right? So these are the Native Americans that, you know, have this tribal confederacy themselves with some more Israelite tribes that are being labeled under the British titles. They moved down the Tennessee River away from the historic Overhill Cherokee towns. They established near a dozen new towns in this frontier area in an attempt to gain distance from encroaching European American settlers. Dragon Canoe and his followers settled at the place where the Great Indian Warpath crossed, X marks the spot, crossed the Chicago Creek near present day Katanooka. Tennessee. They named their town Chickamauga after the stream. The entire adjacent region was referred to in general as the Chickamauga area. American settlers adopted the term to refer to the militant. So these are the ones that made no treaties. They are the militant Cherokee. They're not these other tribes, right, that are claiming it today that were not militant, that did not want to fight alongside with the militants of Tecumse and his brother, Ten Ska Tahawa, the prophet. Seventeen eighty two militia forces under John Sevier and William Campbell destroyed the eleven, destroyed the eleven Cherokee towns. Dragon Canoe led his people further down the Tennessee River, establishing the five new lower Cherokee towns. After Revolutionary War. Western migration increased by pioneers or Ishmael, right? Pioneers from the new states of Virginia, North Carolina, South Carolina, and Georgia. And it goes on to, you know, talk about this constant wars going on, man, that we've been talking about too. Whoa, 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 whoa. Appalachian Mountains, right? We just talked about that with this judeo roman davidas and their connection with the appalachian so all this is correlating all this is connected so much drop here man i just i'm gonna stay focused but you know look drag canoe popping off right cherokee war chief militant he's leading the militant cherokees during the upper revolution or american revolution and afterwards Dragon Canoe's forces were sometimes joined by the upper Muscogee, Chickasaw. So Chickasaw, this is why Tecumseh was rallying them because they had rock with Dragon Canoe. They had rock with the Chickamauga, but they wouldn't rock when it was really time to rock out. At least not all of them. The Shawnee, now you're rocking with Tecumseh and them. Indians from the other tribe nations along with British loyalists and agents of France and Spain the series of conflicts lasted a decade after the American Revolutionary War. Dragon Canoe became the preeminent war leader among the Indians on the Southeast. He served as war chief Skia Gusta of the group known as the Chicamago Cherokee or Lower Cherokee. From 11, or excuse me, 1777 until his death in 1792. So that's two years after these Ishmaelites arrived in Kentucky. I mean, just see how everything's correlated on top of each other. 
get all this drop and, you know, put together the pieces that, you know, we don't even see yet. You know, we need everybody on this investigation right now. Dragon Canoe died February 29th, 1792 at Running Water Town from exhaustion or possibly a heart attack. After dancing all night, celebrating the recent conclusion of an alliance with the Muskogee and Choctaw. Now, what do you mean he's celebrating the conclusion of an alliance with the Muskogee and the Choctaw? And then suddenly he dies of exhaustion. <laughs> he has a heart attack as soon as he makes an alliance with the Muskogee and Choctaw. And then Tecumseh comes back to rally the Choctaw and, you know, Upper Muscogee or whoever that's rocked before and they wouldn't rock out. Push Mataha would not rock out. You see, they, this conflict that Tecumseh and Push had, it, it went deep. I mean, what happened to Dragon Canoe? You know what I'm saying? Well, you know, it's a very complex, you know, inner tribal war going on, right? But to me, it matches up with a lot of the biblical flow. A lot of the biblical flow when it comes to, you know, these, uh, you know, tribes that, you know, really appear to be confederate here and appear to be clearly confederate right here, right? <laughs> Consulted together with one consent. Against you, do they make a covenant? And we're just calling them all out, right? But let's keep going. Let's keep going. So, you know, it's more than a notion, man, when it starts coming together like this. And this Kentucky flow, they're being led by William Henry Harrison, <laughs> principal chief of the Choctaw, you know what I'm saying? You see this whole Choctaw connection going all the way back to Dragon Canoe. At one time, there was an alliance with these Chickasaw, Choctaw, and, you know, all the tribes, you know what I'm saying, understood. After Dragon Canoe, chaos. Tecumse tries to pick up the baton, you know, but they wouldn't get back in order, right? After, or another faction in the conflict was a confederate confederation of numerous Amer North American tribes formed to block American expansion. <laughs> So these militant Cherokee that we just read about, the Shikamagua, are blocking American expansion or invasion. Talking expansion and we're talking invasion. You choose and then tell the story appropriately. We're talking Americans or we're talking invaders from another world. Say it appropriately. Talking Morocco, we're talking Kalelus, man. You know what I'm saying? Leading this alliance was the Shawnee leader, Tecumse. Tecumse is quite an incredible figure, right? Tech is an incredible figure, says John Bowes, PhD, according, or excuse me, associate professor, history at Eastern Kentucky University. Quote, Tecumse is seen as the leader of this movement, this unique movement seeking to develop this pan- Indian Confederacy that is bringing all these tribes together. So the one constant we're getting from this Tecumse flow is that he's bringing all these tribes together, different tribes. But why couldn't he do it when it mattered? Because they had already made deals. They had already made a covenant. with one consent they have consulted together with one consent against you do they make a covenant it's treaty of Fort Wayne ain't no joke man Smithsonian let's get it the treaty of Fort Wayne 1809 I like to keep it Correlating with the timeline, 1809, they say it's no major war, boss. Ain't nothing to see here. Nah, ain't nothing to see here, boss.
Ain't nothing to see here, boss. <laughs> Ain't nothing to see here, boss. 1809. So what we're about to read has a direct effect of what happens with the Tecumse War two years later. All this is culminating U.S. occupying Spanish held West Florida. All this is core culminating with the Tecumse War. You know what I mean? Which lasted way beyond this. I mean, because the Seminole were fighting with them. So when you see first Seminole War, you don't think that's a direct result of the death of Tecumse? They rocking with them, man. Not everybody is, but some are, right? The Creek are. The Shimano are. And who knows? Maybe you had some Choctaw and Shikamawa on the side of the Kumse. You know, I haven't seen their accounts, but it seemed like they didn't, you know, want to break free from, you know, what push was really pushing. You know what I'm saying? But I wouldn't be surprised if there were a few. You know what I'm saying? There's always a few. There's always a few. You know, so so Aha to my Nagas, and again, this ain't pointing the figure at no other tribe or this nothing. We just pointing it at ourselves. We re we reconning ourselves, man. So you 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 here for that? Then be here for it, and be here for us. Because all these wars, Cherokee, Indian, Seminole, 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 Seminole. This is still Chicamago, Mexican, Mexican, Mexican. And we keep dropping out of the Philippines. It's still you too. Right, we you know get the previous draft. So they're they're at eighteen oh nine now. This is where we are. They had already been, you know, over a decade, well over a decade, well over two decades of death leading into this Tecumse War. They made a treaty in eighteen oh nine. Let's read about it. 1809, nearly 1,400 Potawatomi, Delaware, Miami, and Eel River Indians and their allies witnessed, took part in with one consent. We're about to get some comments. Uh, love to my Naga that brought out this Potawatomi. And, um, you know, Hey, all, all the comments are so amazing, man, because they're bringing so much drop, man. So keep leaving comments. I might be late getting to them, but I am going to get to them, and they are going to connect at the right time. So the water to drop nation. 1,400 Pata Watami Delawares, right? These Delaware Moors, right? <laughs> then you got the Lenape tribes, Miamis. These are all Confederate against you, right? This is now matching up with... <laughs> the Tents of Edom, the Ishmaelites, Moabites, Hagarites, Gibal, Ammon, Amalek, Philistia, Tyre, Assyria, and everyone rocking with the children a lot. <laughs> this would be your Moorish Empire, right? <laughs> Nothing to see here, boss. This would be your Moorish Science Temple, right? This is the OG. Got it. Got it. I'm just talking about typical new. Right? We're just talking typical new. Let's keep going. I never had so much fun talking typical new. How about you? All right. So they're saying all these tribes make a confederacy. Remember wise, not just because they were scared that the name of Israel may be no more in remembrance. Let's go. Let's go. Now, they see seeding 2.5 million acres of tribal land in, in present-day Michigan, Illinois, Indiana, Ohio, in exchange for peace. So you, when you see them start getting kicked out of these areas, in some cases, you know what I'm saying? Yeah, the devil didn't keep their word in some of these cases. And in other cases, you know, they, they are the devil, you know what I'm saying? <laughs> Depending on, you know, how you're viewing the adversary. But 
Yeah, they say 2.5 million acres of land was ceded by this treaty. That's weird because in Wiki, <laughs> the Treaty of Fort Wayne, 1809, also called the 10 o'clock line treaty or the 12 mile line treaty is an 1809 treaty that obtained 29,719,530 acres of Native American land for the settlers. We just got that the settlers were fighting against the settlers in Kentucky, right? <laughs> These settlers are fighting against the Native Americans. This is continued warfare between the settlers. And we said, who's the settlers? Well, these settlers <laughs> got 30 million acres of land. And how did this contribute to Ishmael's migration? They popping off. I'm in 1809, right? They been popping off, right? Since the beginning of the Chicamaga War, 1785. Next year, we at war. They start migrating. Next year, we go to war, right? In 1790, they end up in Kentucky. And while they're in Kentucky, they're fighting the Native Americans who did not want to make deals. The Native American tribes that were formed to block American invasion, the invasion of the, the hijack. I can't even call them a European because they're not really truly that. But they found us in a new world. The Kumse is an incredible figure. They're fighting the settlers, right? The Native Americans who... <laughs> were formed to block American expansion, invasion, or fighting the settlers. But these settlers just got 30 million acres of land. And what happens when you get, you know, 30 million acres of land? You start, you start expanding, right? You start doing stuff. You start popping off. I mean, you might... Uh, Shit, you might jump in, <laughs> start establishing some new cities and stuff, you know. <laughs> you might uh, start popping off Morgan County. Morgan is more calm. The G's and C's are interchangeable. Remember that. More calm County is between Indianapolis, Marion County, and Bloomington in Monroe County. Okay. It is included in the Indianapolis Caramel Anderson in Indiana Metropolitan Statistical Area. Got it, got it. The future state of Indiana was first regulated by passage of the Northwestern Ordinance in 1787. That's dangerously close to the Treaty of Peace and Friendship. Ten years into the Chicago War, the governing structure created by this act was superposed over an area that was still largely contested with the country's native. It was contested. <laughs> Why was it contested? because the American Revolutionary War is popping off, right? Although these were being gradually pushed out the area, by 1818, a series of treaties was concluded. Anaka, this is the history of Morgan, <laughs> Morcon County, Indiana, man. And why is it important? Because all this is around this harmonic mountain, all these areas, Morgan, is right around these areas, right? Indianapolis, Marion County, resulting in the confinement of the Miami tribe to the res reserve area and the removal of the Delaware tribe who had dominated central and eastern central Indiana to west of the Mississippi River by 1820. 
clearing the way for colonization. The area was called the Delaware New Purchase until it was divided into Wabash County. Okay. The first, so they said it was named after Daniel Morgan, all right, who defeated the British. All right, so he's whooping up on the Chicamago. The first settlers arrived in Morgan County, 1822. So pay attention to the timelines. I'm talking about the Treaty of Fort Wayne, 1809. This is leading to this settling. You know, what I mean, the Kumse was trying to tell them, don't settle on them lands. That was given because that treaty ain't relevant. It didn't involve us. You can't speak for all of us. I don't care if they gave you that land. Don't you dare settle in that land. And here they go, right? After the Kumse death, here comes Morgan County. He's settling everywhere. The Mooresville area and surrounding communities receive large numbers of Southern Quakers. Yeah, they, they, they welcome them in, right? <laughs> they help them set up shop. They had 30 million acres of land driven to migrate because of their opposition to slavery. Stop it. Paul Hadley and Mooresville resident was a designer of the Indiana flag. Well, shout out to Dragon Canoe, or excuse me, Dragon Child, <laughs> AI Dragon Canoe, you know, who popped off the Nagaville flag, man. And, you know, this is why we rise. So Mooresville, Morgan County, as well as Danville, which is on that map. All these areas are being settled based on this treaty. Treaty of Fort Wayne, 30 million acres, man. 30 million acres. The negotiations primarily involve the Delaware tribe. Wait, stop. Pause. <laughs> I thought the Delawares was being removed. I mean, y'all gotta make y'all gotta make the story make sense. You just said a series of treaties concluded in 1818, resulting in the confinement of the Miami tribe. So this might be treaties that you know came after this Fort Wayne, maybe. The Delaware thought they was going to come up, but then what happened? They were removed, and the Miami was removed. <laughs> but initially, nine years earlier, this is 1818, nine years earlier, the Delaware is involved in the treaty. So it's like they made a move, but it backfired, and they end up getting removed anyway. They didn't get none of that. <laughs> 30 million acres per se. I mean, you know, who knows? You know, maybe they got something, but they were removed. But here they were a part of things. And so it was, you know, I think it listed the Miami on one of them, right? Miami, Delaware. So you're telling me you involved at first, but then nine years later, nine years later, there's a series of treaties that confine the Miami and remove the Delaware. Well, you shouldn't have made the treaties to begin with on the head bone of the Shikamau. Wow. Look at this. Look at this, man. Look at this, man. This September representatives of the Pak Hogan Band of Potawa and Tommy saw the treaty go on view at the National Museum of the American Indian. It is an honor to come full circle to an article that our ancestors signed. Look at this man. Look at this man. Look at this man. So these are, you know, descendants, right? Through the Garlands, through all these other folks that they married into with push push my Taha sister and all that these are their descendants representing for the Choctaw now <laughs> they representing now right and they're proud of their ancestors 
They're proud of what they did. I hope we are fulfilling their hopes and dreams by being here. You know how sick this feels to read this? With all the bloodshed that happened, they, they can't validate the slaughter of the Shikamago Cherokee, the prophet, Tenska Tahawa and Tukumse and Dragon. They can't validate that, but they're proud of what their ancestors did. They are fulfilling their hopes. They are fulfilling their dreams. Members of a delegation of these hijacks <laughs> read the names of the signers of the Treaty of Fort Wayne, 1809. Wow. It's an honor. It's an honor, they say. Treaties are the supreme law of the land. There are 370 native treaties, mostly against you, my life, at the National Archives store, next to treaties with other sovereign nations. Treaties are the law of the land. So why did these Delawares make this treaty? Why didn't it include the Kumse? <laughs> the Treaty of Fort Wayne led to the end of the peace that had prevailed since 1795. 1795? Oh. Oh. So after you finish your slaughter, after 20 years, <laughs> 20 years, damn you, you now have peace. You have quasi wars, even though it's the same shit. They just call it quasi, no major war. And then you got the barbers, the swan knights. Yeah. Sabine, now this came up. It's one of these ancient territories in America as well. To Tecumseh, got it. So you think you're at peace now. And what happens? Let's, let's read this slowly. Treaty of Fort Wayne led to the end of the peace <laughs> that had prevailed since 1795 between the Ohio Valley nations and the United States the peace so these ohio valley nations made a treaty <laughs> as native lands decreased through the westward expansion of the united states resistance grew under the leadership of ten skatawa the shawnee prophet and his brother Tecumse, the famous war chief not all the tribes of the region were agreeable to the signing Individual members of the Miami objected, saying it was time to put a stop to the encroachments of the whites. Individual members. So I'm not over here demonizing all these tribes and everybody associated with the tribes that were part of these treaties. We're saying that we know we got real ones and all these. Not every part of the Miami wanted this. Not all the Delawares wanted this. Whoever's, whoever's speaking for them wanted this. Not all the Choctaw wanted to go against Tech. Not all the Chickasaw, Chickasaw wanted to go against Czech or Muscogee. They were individuals that were, you know, speaking up, that were rocking. But, you know, the ones in power had the power. Three hundred and seventy native treaties, man. We're just talking about a few, man. William Henry Harrison, here we go again, led a U.S. delegation of 14 representatives. And again, they say 2.5 million acres, which we know is more like 30 million acres. Individual members of the Miami objected. Governor Harrison pressured them to rely on treaty making. Treaties made by the United States with Indian tribes are considered as binding as those which 
are made with the most powerful kings on the other side of the big water, Harrison says. So that's his way of saying, look, we're going to keep it. We make these type of treaties with kings. Eventually, the Miami conceded. Within two years, Governor Harrison led an attack on Prophetstown. The camp of Tin Ska Tawa and his followers on Tippecanoe River. Tippecanoe. Why is it so close to their holy mountain of harmonics and their Mecca and their Morocco? And we're talking about Moroccan treaties and <laughs> Israel's falling right at their hands. physically, and with the stroke of a pen. Wow. The Battle of Tippecanoe set off a new war. <laughs> so after that popped off, it's all the way up. Because this Treaty of Fort Wayne, they said, led to the end of a peace, right? So that for all this time, they said, all right, we've been fighting these militant Cherokee this whole time. They thought they had a little peace here. <laughs> and then this treaty was formed here, giving the hijack 30 million acres and Tacoons, they just couldn't take it no more. <laughs> so we popped back off and it, it was up pretty much this whole entire time after that. For the next, <laughs> it was all the way up. For the next, <sighs> Hundred. Let's see, we're going from 1811. All this is up. I mean, it's all us. But specifically, you know, on our front lines, which include Mexico, you know what I'm saying? You know, you got about 80 years straight. And then it continues. So it was up. I ask you again, like I asked you before, when were you a homeborn slave? At, at what point were you in slavery? Stop me when you get to the point that you're in slavery. No, they just reclassified you and told you that this wasn't you and that you was in Africa the whole time and that you just popped up off a boat. But they didn't say these African slaves were popping off the Chickamauga War. And they sell us on this American Revolutionary War, this white people in America versus white people in Britain. And they're fighting for the freedom of slaves. That's their narrative. In reality, Takum says fighting for the freedom of his people from captivity and for our lands to be free lands and for 30 million acres not to be signed over to the hijack. 30 million acres. The treaty has two nicknames in popular American culture, the 10 o'clock line treaty of 1809 and the 12 mile line treaty, both in this 12 mile line. I mean, that's all longitude and latitude, man. Both of which are associated with the disparate parcels of land defined by the treaty. The first nickname comes from the tradition that says the Native Americans did not trust the surveyor's equipment. So a spear was thrown down at 10 o'clock and the shadow became the treaty line. So they, they put their own spear down to mark uh, where they're going to give up 30 million acres of land. <laughs> the 12 mile line was a reference to the Greenville Treaty and the establishment of a new line parallel to it, but 12 miles further west. 1809, Harrison began to push for a treaty to open more land for white American settlement. The Miami, Wea, and Kickapoo were vehemently opposed to selling any more land but they already started the process. The parasite's gonna want more. They're talking about the Wabash River, right? All right, so you got this Wabash River going all the way, cutting through, literally into the holy mountain cube of harmonics, right? Literally. It looks like it curves down through to Mecca. So Mecca's along the Wabash all the way to Fort Wayne. We're just talking about the Fort Wayne Treaty. 
Okay. We're just talking about tip of canoe. And Governor Harris that led the attack. Governor Harris, we're talking about the same Harris, man. With the same harassment. To the copper color comes. Principal chief of the Choctaw Nation. I mean, y'all got to make it make sense. Like I said, we approaching Preston from an American indigenous autochthonous perspective. You know, we did the Mongo flow, but we realized that is America and it, all this is connected. You know what I'm saying? Uh, you know, this Romani flow, this Kalalu's flow. Now we're seeing it in real time. This part of his story is extremely pivotal to the investigation. Because they have consulted together with one consent. Against you, do they make a covenant? Oh, wow. So the new war was started with the giving up of all this land, all this disrespect. To whom they said, we had nothing to do with this. Tecumseh was the powerful leader of a breakaway Shawnee group living just north of the area covered in the treaty. He questioned the legality of the treaty, stating that these native leaders did not have the right to sign the treaty. Imagine someone signing away your home, 30 million acres of your homes, your waters, they're taking over the water, the Wabash waterways. Anaga, <laughs> the Wabash rivers, they're cutting right through, you know, up into the con. I mean, they're taking all this, the con con key, they, they're taking the basins, <laughs> they're taking the moraines, the white rivers, 1810, that's a year before it popped back off. <laughs> Managa, why is is why is Ishmael migrating, popping off in Kentucky with the Kentuckians fighting the militant native Nagas, and they're just peacefully migrating around their cube. Make it make sense. I'm just surfing away with you, my Naga. <laughs> I know you surfing away with me. I know you seeing clearly what's going on here, man. This is the war that never stopped. When did you become a slave? In the 1900s? 1700s, you were fighting. Fighting. Before this, you were fighting. When were you a slave? You only tell people they're slaves to make them feel helpless if you tell them that they were revolutionaries. <laughs> well, they want to hijack that with the Boston Tea Party, right? They want to hijack the Green Dragon. They want to hijack, give me liberty or give me death. We been on that shit. Oh, we came over here to get freedom from Black George in Europe. No, you came over here to make a confederacy so that the name of Israel may be no more in remembrance to cut us off from being a tribe tribe to cut us off from being a nation i mean everything everything is being revealed right now you know what's really being revealed though it's a few things i mean <laughs> it's pressed to 86 man um looking at this map i see a lot of this glaciation demarcations even in the legend you know it has these um you know legend you know just letting you know what all these you know little symbols mean but you know right here it says the limit of glaciation approximately edge of glacial 
advance. Here it says the path and direction of annual, annual, annual migration of the Ishmaelites, which led me to say, whoa, you do this every year? <laughs> you do it every year? So when we see these tiny dots, this is the glacial or glaciation demarcation. So why would glaciers, why would there be a glacial advance? It just got me thinking like, you know, what do glaciers have to do with anything? <laughs> why, why would glacial advances, you know what I'm saying, have anything to do with this map? And, I mean, the main one I'm, I'm looking at, I'm sure there's more, but this whole area here is the limit of glaciation, right? Okay. Just got me thinking about cold weather. <laughs> and it kind of brought us all into this uh, little ice age scenario. And we had talked about this little ice age before. The Little Ice Age was a period of regional cooling. Now, just, I'm not making this stuff up, my naga. They got glaciation, you know what I'm saying, boundaries, right? They got glacial advances popping off in the 1700s. Seventeen eighty five. this is 18th century stuff, right? Okay. Keep the 18th century in mind, and let's talk about a little ice age and what this glaciation was the result of, possibly. Let's just kind of see what's popping. Little ice age, regional cooling occurred after the medieval warm period. It was not a true ice age of global extent, so it wasn't frozen everywhere, but there is some glaciation when it comes to North America. Mm. The term was introduced into scientific literature by Francois E. Mathis in 1939. The time period has been conventionally defined as extending from 16th century to 19th century. Glaciation. 1785 to 19th century. 1905, glaciation, glaciation, all this glaciation, all down here, okay, okay. Let's keep reading. Actually, let's get it from here. <laughs> let's just get to it, all right, so. Several causes have been proposed cyclical lows in solar radiation, heightened volcanic activity, changes in ocean circulation, variations in Earth's orbit and axial tilt, stop it, inherent variability in global climate and decreases in human population. Whoa, whoa, you put this last for a reason. <laughs> We're talking a little ice age, and they're saying that several causes have been proposed. So here, here's a possible cause for a little ice age, mainly in America, right? Uh, I don't know. Uh, decreases in human population, such as from Black Death and the epidemics emerging in Americas upon human, or I'm sorry. European content, infectious diseases, pre -colonial. so, <laughs> nah. They want to say, although a, a variety of infectious diseases existed in American pre-Columbian times, the limited size of population, smaller number of domesticated animals and with zoonic, zoonotic diseases and limited interaction between these populations, hampered the transmissions of communicable diseases. So none of that turned into outbreaks, okay? The European contact, 
where we got out of uh, American Holocaust by David Standard. You know, they were purposely spreading their disease all throughout, you know, America. They were this black plague throwing it in the trees. They were sickening and diseasing everything up on purpose. This was part of the biological chemical warfare that they admit, <laughs> you know, and plus just the contact of them, period, was causing these infectious diseases. I ain't talking no tenderoni, <laughs> but you know what I'm saying, right? So, I mean, that train's never late, you know, nothing's new here, right? So, Black Death, epidemics, causes an ice age, man, like a plague, right? A plague happened as a result of all this decreasing in death in the Americas. Did you know how cold it got for these jabronis? Man, I mean, they were, they thought they were in cold in Europe. When they came over here, it was colder than that. There are no consensus on when the Little Ice Age began, but a series of events before the known climatic minima has <laughs> the minimum <laughs> has often been re referenced. In 13th century, pack ice began advancing southwards in the North Atlantic, as did glaciers in Greenland. We're talking a glacial line, right? Anecdotal evidence suggests expanding glaciers almost worldwide, expanding glaciers i'm just talking the glacial the glaciation the limit of glaciation let's go <laughs> why would these glaciers be here if not for a ice age that had just been popping off Cold summers and ice growth began abruptly between 1275 and 1300. That's where it began to then, according to Miller. Sixteen fifty, first climactic minimum occurred, so they're still going through it in the 1700s. Twelve seventy five to thirteen hundred, carbon radiocarbon dating of plants show that they were killed by glaciation. Right, that here's that word again, glaciation. I mean, wow. Historians have argued that Jewish populations were also blamed for climactic deterioration during the Little Ice Age. So. You know, they're talking Hebrew still. Christianity was official, the official religion in Western Europe. And its populations had a great degree of anti-Semitism. There was no direct link between Jews and weather conditions. <laughs> Jews were blamed only for indirect consequences such as disease. For example, outbreaks of plagues were often blamed on Jews. So... Just think about Hebrews and the connection between these plagues of Egypt. They're blaming the Hebrews for these plagues. It's their fault, you know. It's, it's, it's their God doing this to them, right? In Western European cities during the 1300s, Jewish populations were murdered. Now, they don't talk about this part of the Holocaust, right? We ain't talking 19 something something Hitler or nothing, right? We're talking 1300. So now they got to claim these tribes of the 1300s to even fit into this. So you can, you know, change Jewish to Judah, right? Hebrew. Hebrew populations were murdered in an attempt to stop the spread of the plague. They started killing Nagas. Maybe that'll stop the plague. Rumors were spread that. Jews were either poisoning wells themselves or conspiring against Christians by telling those with leprosy to poison the wells. As a response to such violent scapegoating, Jewish communities sometimes converted to Christianity or migrated to the Ottoman Empire. 
Italy or the Holy Roman Empire. Okay. <laughs> okay. <laughs> We've seen it come together piece by piece. North America, early European explorers and settlers in North America reported exceptionally severe winters. This is interesting, right? And this is getting us right into this 1600, 1700 situation, this glacial situation on the map. For example, according to Lamb, Samuel Champlain, Champlain reported bearing ice along the shores of Lake Superior, Michigan, huh? <laughs> In June 1608, both Europeans and indigenous peoples suffered excess mortality in May during the winter of 1607 and 08. An extreme frost, extreme frost, was meanwhile reported in Jamestown, Virginia. Native Americans formed leagues in response to food shortages, plagues, right? Famine, gone, biblical proportion. The journey of Pierre de Troyes, Chavillier de Troyes, who led an expedition to James Bay in 1686, recorded that the bay was still littered with so much floating ice that he could hide behind it in his canoe, littered with floating ice. So when you talk about these glaciation lines, when you talk about these, you know, demarcations, these lines of glaciation, you say, what are glaciers doing near Louisville, Kentucky? What are glaciers doing near Indianapolis? Why is there glaciers reported on these maps in 1700s? And then you say there's a little ice age that no one's talking about. And this little ice age is primarily affecting America as an extreme frost. Frost was meanwhile reported in Jamestown, Virginia. You got this uh, 1868 James Bay recorded that the bay was still littered with so much floating ice he could hide behind it on his canoe. In the winter of 1780, New York Harbor froze, which allowed people to walk from Manhattan Island to Staten Island. 1780. We're looking at a map in 1785 with glaciation lines. 1785, they got glaciation lines, but not. Glaciation lines in America. Little Ice Age, 1780, New York Harbor froze. Come on, man. <laughs> Allowing people to walk from Manhattan to Staten Island. The extent of mountain glaciers had mapped, had been mapped by the late 19th century in the North and South Temporal zones equilibrium line altitude the boundaries separating zone and net accumulation from those of net ablation were 100 meters lower than they were in 17 or 1975 in glacier national park the last episode of glacier advance came in the late 18th and 19th centuries 1879 the famed naturalist john moore found that glacier bay ice had retreated uh, 48 miles so we have the lines of glaciation demarcation chesapeake bay maryland large temperate excursions were possibly related to the lines changes in the strength of north atlantic thermohaline circulation because the little ice age took place during european colonization of america come on man so this ice age is taking place during the European colonization of the Americas, which is why it's called the Little Ice Age, and which is why it's a glaciation happening on this map in America, correlating with the tribe of Ishmael in 1785. So much death had to occur for all this freeze over to occur, and it connects directly with the European colonization of the Americas and my Naga, I can't make this shit up. Because the Little Ice Age took place during the European colonization of the Americas, it threw off a lot of the early colonizers who had expected the climate of North America to be similar to the climate of Europe. <laughs> so they expected the climate in America to be similar to the climate of Europe at similar latitudes. However, North America, 
at least in Canada and northern United States, had hotter summers and colder winters than in Europe. So everything was thrown off. That's why they were thrown off. It threw off a lot of early invaders. That effect was aggravated by the Little Ice Age. And unpreparedness led to the collapse of many early European settlements in North America. When colonists settled at Jamestown, historians agree it was one of the coldest time periods in the last 100 or shallot, 1,000 years. Drought was also a huge problem in North America during the Little Ice Age, and the settlers arrived in Roanoke during the largest drought of the past 800 years. So they had drought, they had famine in Managa. It was the coldest time period in the last 1,000 years, which is why you have glaciation, a limit of glaciation. You never think about glaciers in America. But when you factor in a little ice age, you might think about glaciers in America. There's also glaciation happening, you know, all around this Ohio situation, Cincinnati, you know what I mean? And they kept talking about the north, so I would assume there's glaciation in the north. You know what I mean? At this point, they're focusing on this, uh, you know, Louisville and you know, this lower Illinois area, you know what I mean? And again, glaciers in America connected to a little ice age. I mean, we're just talking glaciation, man. I mean, I just saw this on the map and I said, I've never heard anyone address glaciers or glaciation in the 18th century. In the 18th century, man, in America. (laughs) <laughs> but if you're going to be in America under Lake Michigan, Chicago, Indianapolis, and Louisville, we're talking, we're talking glaciation and glaciation limits, edges of the glacial advances. Well, then what can validate that? And the only thing that can connect, I mean, there's sinkholes, there's hella sinkholes about around this glaciation. This little ice age records the coldest time periods in the last 1,000 years. I mean, whatever is going down, whether it's a plague because of the Hebrew lives that were being taken, it's being affected really everywhere. Asia's feeling it. The Gurkhan, Gurchin, Gurkhan people are feeling it. Even in Africa, they're feeling it. Timbuktu is feeling it. They're getting flooded out from the glaciation. And Arctic is popping off. The Greenland ice sheet is popping off. Synchronous global cooling. And this is a really interesting connection with Antarctica because what does this have to do with the ice wall? This is glaciation and this cooling, they're trying to downplay it like, oh, it wasn't really that bad. Shit, shit. We're talking about an ice age. And did the Antarctic ice form around that time? Did the ice wall get put up around that time, Anaga? The ocean sediment core from the eastern Bransfield Basin and Antarctic Peninsula shows centennial events with the authors linked to the Little Ice Age and the medieval warm period. So those are coinciding. The authors note that, quote, other unexplained climactic events comparable in duration and amplitude to the Little Ice Age and the medieval warm period events also appear. Unexplained climactic events. So they have all their uh, theories. They got this dome ice core showing lower lower levels of CO2 mixing ratios between 1550 and 1800. That covers this migration period, you know, as well. Little Ice Age. 
I'll leave this link for you. Causes, little ice age referred to a period beginning in around 1300, just like with the Genghis Khan flow, and lasting until the middle of the 18th century, in which the average worldwide temperature may have cooled by 0.1 degrees Celsius worldwide. Now we're talking American, man. It was the coolest, coldest temperatures. These jabronis were not prepared to, when they came to America. This is taking place during European colonies invasion. And they're experiencing the coldest time period. And then it would get super hot. <laughs> it was so hot that European newcomers were dying in the heat. So super cold, super hot. Managa, it was not the spot. We're thinking American climates like we do now, but it was in chaos because of what they were doing to you. It was in chaos because of the bloodshed. It was in chaos, man. They said what? talking causes, causality. Several causes had to be proposed. And one of those causes is the epidemics emerging in the Americas during European contact. Someone is proposing this, man. I'm not making this shit up. Someone is saying that did they kill so many Indians that it caused an ice age? Now we got the Perry Reese map popping off with no ice, but then we got ice after the 1600s. <clears throat> I mean, make it make sense. Was it a plague from the most high power or was it some other magical spell going on? We got to address the little ice age when we have glaciation line. After 1785, man, during the migration in the mountain of harmonics, they popping all this off during an ice age. <laughs> Managa, glaciation lines. <clears throat> the fall of you turned everything upside down. They said even, uh, the flow of the Mississippi or the flow of the Niles, you know, switched directions, everything, they, they, a polar shift, but we're just talking magnetics. This is the Presta Hour, man. We popping up. Man, so let's make a great dismount. <laughs> let's just keep going, man. <clears throat> so. Despite its time, this period was far from a deep freeze. Okay, no problem. Think instead of a regular seesaw, rapid climactic shifts it's driven by complex and still little understood interactions between atmosphere and ocean. Sound like the creator is plaguing you if it's little understood. Oh, Ice Age is an exaggeration. Others disputing the beginning and ending events. Historians have suggested that severe weather during the American Civil War, Revolutionary War, may have been an effect of the Little Ice Age. But nearly all agree that the 17th century, when the English founded the Virginia colony at Jamestown, was one of the coldest in the last thousand. You think about how cold it was when these English these hijacks is found in their first colony. A wild turned it all the way down on these. They said, look, you, you ain't going to have no comfort here, man. There, ain't, there wasn't paradise for them. It was your paradise. Virgin land is your paradise. For them, it was the coldest it's been in a thousand years. Reduced solar level, reduced solar activity. <laughs> Hawaii was shutting it down. He cooled it off, man. <laughs> he was, it was clear that this land wasn't pleased with them. All this is a result, Managa, of the treaties. Cut 
come and let us cut them off of being a nation. The solar activity decreased, man. Damn near vanished. <laughs> they were in the dark again. The same plague that followed that they was in in the Black Death in Europe followed them over here. They were still plagued. Everywhere they went came the cold. They don't want to admit it. They brought the plague. They brought the sickness. They brought the disease to this day. Let's talk uh, Journal of the Moorish Paradigm because I'm still tripping off Morocco here, man. The Holy Cube. All this happening while we're at war, you know? 30 million acres given away. Come on, man. 29,719,530 acres of Native American land for the settlers. Who's the settlers? Who's moving to Kentucky? The continuing warfare between the settlers and the Native American. Who's moving to Kentucky? Yeah, well, you know, Ishmael. <laughs> Ben Ishmael were a collective of thousands of runaway slaves coming out of Morocco, coming out of Africa. And they got some indigenous uh, Nagas that were confederate against Israel that say, yeah, let's make one consent and make a treaty, right? Let's make a treaty. Are you putting the story together? Uh, it's just me. <laughs> I think we up in here, Drop Nation. <clears throat> I mean, we up in here. Let's talk about it. Let's go. Hey, man. <clears throat> this is something we all, you know, have to. There has to be a fusion in our heart bones around the destruction of our brothers and sisters. If we ain't fused and feeling and mourning for what has been the result of these treaties and the covetous of our nation, stabbing each other in the back, siding with the ops. We're just talking about Kentucky, right? <laughs> So Ishmael forms a confederacy with, you know, Moab and them, you know. Ishmael and them, you know, Edom and them, you know. The usual suspects. And the poor whites, which is who you now think is rich. They now have the titles of royals. They're now the American, right? But they're not the Preston. <laughs> Y'all looking out for that media storm? Okay, I, I don't know. They're now the American. Native of America originally applied to the originals or Abba. You know, someone says Abba, it's Abba. Hey, Abba, Abba, Ama. The originals, okay? Copper colored races that were unlike any other races you've seen before that were found here, not brought here into your colonies by the Europeans. Found these people that are copper colored, that are original here, but now their title of Khan, Khan, Khan is applied to the descendants of the hijacks that are born here. <clears throat> Lock, man, we're doing a lot of talking. We're popping off. Press of John 86. So now you're born here and you take our titles, but you're not copper color races, but you're American. But you're not the con, but you're an American. <laughs> Let's go. I mean, I think we see the picture. 
poor whites take the titles of Americans, descendants of the Europeans born. Poor whites and uh, the Indian confederacies against the Kumse and uh, Ishmael and uh, Edom and Moab and the hacker guys, you know, all that. They create their colony, their confederacy in the Kentucky Hills in 1790. While you're already at war for damn near 10 and a half years, right? They're now migrating. They're just popping off, right? Mecca and to 350 mile loops every year. Morocco. Let's talk about it, man. Let's talk about Morocco. Let's go. I'll do this quickly, man. Ben Ishmael tribe. All right. So I'm belly flopped into page 28, Journal of Morris Paradigm, Journal of Morris Paradigm. Click the links. You see the same map, right? Look at this triangle. Tip of canoe, Mecca. Uh-huh. Okay. Kankaki. Let's go. Annual migration. <laughs> this is 1810. The one that we're rocking with. And again, love to the bro minister informing for this drop because you popped it off, man. Hey, he love to you. Hey, how to you, man? 1785. So this is a little later. Eighteen ten. All right. Migrational route of the Ben Ishmael tribe. Ben Ishmael collection of Lenape, Delaware. So now we're getting specific, cause yeah, we just you know we're talking about the Fort Treaty. Delaware came up as one of the tribes that were Confederate against. The Kumse and them, and this is what popped it off, right? The Kumse War, 1811, 1812. So the Delaware, when we're reading about these Ben Ishmael's, are, <laughs> they're directly making the treaties. This is the golden link, my name. All right, we're not just bringing this shit up. We're addressing what's going on. The same Delaware that ended up taking the L, you know, 10, 20 years later, or 18, 18, nine years later, they now get moved and, and rolled up on, according to the story, we don't know, you know what I mean? We don't know everything, we're, we're, we're trying to figure this out, this is crazy talk, this is crazy talk to us, because we got glaciers in America, we got ice ages popping off, we got Ishmael going crazy, because this tribe of Ishmael is, the Delawares, the Nati, Cotis, Iroquois, and other tribes. These are Moorish, right? <laughs> yeah, they know who they are. They just let you forget who you are because the tribe of Israel shall be no more in remembrance. Damn. These were those who refused to integrate into white society. Really? Because, I mean, you made treaties. These so-called Indians were actually Moors, right? Okay. I mean, we figured that because you boldly put it on the map, you know, that the Moors science temples popping up. So we could put all this together without no conjecture, just real talk. It could be seen by the name Ben Ishmael and their migration route from places they named Morocco, Muhammad, and Mecca. Further confirms the fact that they were Moors, their names, and their names of their migration route does not sound very much like those used by Indians as we are taught. The parts of Indian Illinois where they settled 
were uh, now so-called black areas or ghettos presently. Remember the Jackson song, I'm going back to Indiana. Perhaps they were descended from Ben Ishmael. The, the descendants of the Ben Ishmael were some of the earliest members of the Moore Science Temple of America. Many were descended of the Lenape, the Delaware, the Nanticotes. In the essay entitled Nanticot, Moore Folk Medicines, these people refer to themselves as Moors. They are still some to this day in parts of Delaware who refer to themselves as Moors. The government kept classifying them as Negroes, which they fought tooth and nail because, not because they did not like who they were, but precisely because they knew who they are, man, <laughs> right? They love who they were. They didn't want the inferior status of Negro. Man. So he show you some, you know, some some of their people. Now, this is super interesting because they were talking about Catholics, or you know, they're talking about outside, you know, anyone outside of Christianity. You know, when we first opened up this drop right here, slaves were forbidden to carry arms, all that. You can't lift up your hand against a Christian. Okay, just remember this. You can't lift up your hand against a Christian and see how this connects. <laughs> the condition of slavery was imposed upon all servants, whether Negroes, Moors, or which ones, right? Mulattoes, Indians brought into the colony or sea or land, whether converted to Christianity or not, provided they were not of Christian parentage or country or Turks or Moors. All this is the same thing, and they about to blow up their own spot. We just surfing the wave. The more is the Turk is the Christian, man. One, you already know this because you're talking zoos, you're talking, you know, Thoth and uh, Horus and all these Egypt and Atlantis shit with Christianity connected directly to Atlantis gods. And so are the more situations. So that it has to be the same thing. Christ just means anointed. Who's anointed? You're talking Apollo. Who's anointed, right? Son of what? Son of God. You're talking Atlantis talk, but they're giving it up right in your face, Paul. That you are all good if you come from Christian parents. Now, aren't Catholics also Christians? <laughs> Turks or Moors? Look how they blow their spot up, though. Look how they blow their spot up, though. Now, this is a document he said was given to him by... Brother Bob Daly L. Bay. So this is their stuff, okay? It is from the, the permanent mission of Morocco in New York. It is an article relating how Moors came to New England area in the third century AD. Managa, if you just came in the third century AD, then you ain't even predating what's happening in the second century. Body bag. <laughs> we'll hey, it's press 86. We out of here. <laughs> uh, uh. Now, second century is going to take you to the 100s and stuff. <clears throat> you, you ain't even predating these queens, these, these Davidas, rocking with Kalelus, these kings already here. There's already a kingdom here. There's already a kingdom here, man. You're coming in three coming in the fourth century you're late there's already a kingdom here is this a moorish kingdom huh is it morocco then brother no brother there's already a kingdom of hashara the tribes of hawa connected with mu connected with the vortexes you can't tell us we from over there you found us in a new world You've been writing stories about us, looking for us. We cousins, right? We related, huh? Yeah, well, apparently, according to the permanent mission of Morocco, New York, the Moors came from New York, New England area in the third century AD. In the area where the brother in the previous picture is from. If you just came over here, you're not. This don't make you indigenous to America. This lets us know that that's when you colonize. <laughs> that's when you're trying to set up 
Morocco, brother. But Morocco wasn't here. You just came over here in the third century. Let's go quickly, man. These are body bags on body bags. Body bag for the illusion. You can't be indigenous to America if you just popping up and add a thousand years to this because you know they took it away. That means they just got here in the 13th century. Damn. Now we back at Genghis Khan again. Uh-oh. Can we give you third century or do we have to give you 13th century? <laughs> Damn. In the area <clears throat> where the brother... And the previous pictures from the article says that Moroccans discovered America a thousand years before Columbus. Stop. Columbus is 1492. A thousand years before that is 492. Now you're in the fifth century and you still don't be predating the kings and queens of Kalelos. Now you're in the fifth century. Now you're in the sixth century. Which one is it? A thousand years before Columbus is when you discovered America. That don't mean that there weren't Nagas already here, connected to Mu, connected to Lemuria. The mystical lands, Hawaku, the lands of Hiva. We already here. You just got here a thousand years before Columbus. Y'all just told on yourself. And look at how this connects to this Christian drop. Because I just said that they just said that you got to be of Christian parents or Turks or Moors. And I'm saying, I'm realizing that's all the same because they about to tell on themselves the Christian is the Turk, is the Moor, is the Muslim. It's all the same power. Tell on yourselves. Let's go. <laughs> Casablanca. Come on. For the dismount. August 16th. America was discovered by Moroccans. <laughs> All right. This is their documents, man. I'm reading. <laughs> Read with me. I know, it's, I know it's blur. America was discovered by Moroccans 1,000 years before Christopher Columbus wrote Catholic Digest in an article which was reproduced Thursday by the Moroccan Daily. Uh, something Sahara and something something. Are right, you sick? According to the these developed or theses developed by John Gallagher, archaeologist and professor at Fordham University, the author of the article, Frederick Pohl, uh, asserts that there are irrefutable evidences attesting to the settlement of Moroccan Catholics in North America in the third century. Body bags. What do you look? Count the body bags, y'all. Count the body bags. Bodies on bodies in Kalelus. Akis on Akis the Amaru. We talk of Sylvanus to Texas. Genealogy never connects. Why? Wow. Moroccan Catholics? Moroccan Catholics. I never put the Moor with the Catholic, but the Catholic is the Katai, and the Katai is the Cathay, and the Catholics are just biting off the name Cathay because Cathay means a pure land. So they want to be pure, like the Romans want the Riman. They want to be the Pomegranaga, the Pomegranate, Granada, Naga. They want to be the Cathay, Katai, Cathay, Catholics. The Pope want to be the Presta. You put it all together, you got the settlement of the Moroccan Catholics. And they just said, you got to be Catholic. You got to be a Christian to not be in slavery. The condition of slavery was imposed upon all servants. Uh, provided they were not Catholics, Christians. This puts them back into the treaty. This was a treaty before the treaty. This is 1682. They already had a treaty, man. They, they didn't just start working together in 1785, 86. It's already, it's already one and the same. When they're talking about 
this Christian Muslim war in history, they were working together to find a Preston. They were working together to conquer the Hebrew empire, Jerusalem. They worked together. Even among their own little skirmishes, they were ultimately the same power, serving the same powers. The Turks, the Moors, the Catholics, the Christians. Managa, I'm talking Moroccan Catholics. In North America, in the third century, a thousand years before Columbus is when they were conquering. But I said add a thousand years back to that, and you're back into the 13th century, the 1200s, Genghis Khan, Preston John, chronology, Anatoly Fomenko. The article affirmed that the Moroccan Catholics had settled in what is currently called Connecticut. Khan. Connecticut, Moroccan, it's all about the Khan, the press, they're getting the press to the Khan, Genghis Khan, Moroccan, Connecticut, near the coast of the Low Islands, something like that, South. Evidences are fascinating archaeological discovery in the U.S. Northeast involving inscriptions engraved on granite outcrops in the Coca Ponset Forest. These traces are believed to be the works of a monastic brotherhood which fled the Vandals and who had invaded North Africa in 429, right? 1,000 years before Columbus, right? At 1,000 years, <clears throat> you're back in the 1400s, Columbus territory. If they're, in, if they're fleeing out of Africa, then my naga, you ain't American, <laughs> I know you want everything to be Atlantis. That's how Atlanteans think. That's how Egyptians think. That's how conquerors, colonizers think. The whole world is mine, right? I know. But you got that from us. Because King David is the head and not the tail. Because the scepter never depart. Because my naga, you only have I known of all the families. So this worldwide you know, world emperor, you know, this came from the Rex and the Goose. This came from the King of Kings. This came from the Khan of Khans. This came from the Prester title. Now they want to be worldwide conquerors and emperors, but you got to do that with Hawa. You got to do that with the dragons, man. Free Phoenix. You can't just, you know, do it with your, you know, fake machinery and, and your lust for power that's only going to last so long. You got to have the code in you to be the only ones that Hawaii has known of all the families of the earth. Managa, all the families of the earth. I've only known you. <laughs> They're confederate against us, being confederate against us. <sighs> now we see the more is the Catholic. <laughs> we just talking Cathay. Yeah. Let's keep going. I mean, this is their prophet. We talked about it, Noble Drew Ali, right? Hey, respectfully, that's the prophet of the Moabites, okay? The, the tribes of Jacob never had a prophet outside the tribes of Jacob. Why would Hawaii have to go outside all the tribes of Jacob to find a Moabite prophet for us? When does it happen? So this is not for you. This is for the Moorish nation. This is for the Moabites, the Canaanite, the Ammonite, and on and on. Northwest Africa is America. <laughs> so when they say Africa, they are talking America. Year 1886, he's born. That's well after the Treaties of Peace and Friendship, unless we're talking 1306. Uh-oh. These dates, man, chronology. So he would claim Cherokee. This is why I said Cherokee is not just, you know, Israelites. Yeah, the Moabites would also claim to be we the people. The Karakata. Hmm. I mean, how real is this? Yeah, man. Respectfully, you know, we're seeing clearly. 
So, you know, you can learn the history, you know, about Timothy Drew, man, popping off, man, out of North Carolina. And, <clears throat> you know, how he's, you know, fully tied in, fully connected. You know, he sees the vision for his people to connect them within this system so that they have more life, right? But that more life is not an eternal situation. That's a temporary situation because you could only hide in the banner of this confederacy for so long. They can't protect you forever. Yeah, you can be a citizen and 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 do your citizen protection and be be not a slave for a minute and you know avoid certain parts of the judgment of Hawaii, but you can't run forever. And while we got judged, at least we got it out the way. You're like somebody who escapes a prison camp and you was in a camp. You could have you you could have <laughs> You could have KTC, man. You, you could have tribed up. You didn't have to leave the camp because now you can't come back to the camp. And when they catch you, you're still going to get your time. But instead of going to a camp, you're going to go to a medium. You'll be lucky to go to a low. <laughs> you might get maxed out. But you was in a camp. <laughs> Y'all could have... Y'all could have handled yourselves and handled your business and, and, and took your judgment, man. You know what I'm saying? Instead, you made deals and treaties and prolonged it. So now we, while we pop off, the majority of y'all got to gotta get this work. Y'all thought you got it already, but man, you got blood on your hands. He was inspired to learn about the heritage and knowledge of the ancient Moorish people. He began to travel the old land as a Mex. He lived with and mingled with various tribes of the indigenous Moors. You got a lot of these indigenous groups that pop up trying to tribe up with you, but they're coming with a different flag, right? And this is a deep separation because this is a ancient, you know, frequency problem that we've been having the power we serve noble drew ali's inspired activity and determination were the impetus for the yet to be manifested moorish movement man okay this movement was destined to progressively activate and change the whole frame of mind status and political condition for the defeated moorish nation for the defeated moorish nation about it we just popping off this is the Preston <laughs> Ow. so why are you defeated in 1886 what happened what happened man I mean you know we, we got to see clearly at this point what happened from 17 you know such and such when these treaties were made 1785, Tacoma State's War. You know, why the, why the defeatist attitude in 1886? 1886. What was going on? You know, back to the timeline. U.S. show of force against Haiti? <laughs> U.S. invades Mexico. U.S. being in Mexico. Oh, 1886, Apache Wars, Pleasant Valley War, U.S. invades Mexico. Apache, all right, all right. So we got to get all these pieces so we can put the full story together. We got to understand why you defeated, why you feeling defeated in 18, you know, 86. Well, at least that's when he was born, 1886. So I guess, you know, maybe they felt defeated a little after 1886. Let's see, uh, you know, back to the timeline. So later, you know, Later, I guess once we start getting around here, maybe the shift in power ain't, you know, the 
the treaties ain't just treating out like they wanted it to. You know, similar to the Delaware and the Miami tribes, it, you know, it just wasn't that sweet after a while. But all this time you was migrating, you was getting land and it was sweet. You know, it was it was sweeter than those on the other side of the war that you're making treaties on, right? Yeah, man, unless you're Christian or <laughs> Moroccan Catholic, you know, you Moroccan Catholic, you all good, apparently. All right. So they got a profit. They got a profit. I'll leave this for you. You can get more into it. You know, you can get way more into it. You know, they're talking about their empresses and their royals, man. And, you know, they connect them to these, you know, Egyptians, and Nubians and Ethiopians, back to the Lenape, Delaware flow, right? Okay. Back to the Sudan. Everything's connected. Back, They got everything. It's all Atlantis. So, <laughs> indigenous, Aboriginal, talk to this. They're that too. You know, everything, everything, everything. <laughs> yeah, man. I mean, it's a lot of information here. You go dig on it, man. Uh, the Holy Prophet Noble Drew Ali told the Moors that the Europeans went to the Moroccan government and asked for permission to come over here to America to develop this land. And they were given a 50 year mandate to do so. So apparently the treaties of peace and friendship last for 50 years. They get renewed, yada, yada. Then the American the Europeans went to an old sheik and asked him to give them some, oh, some people to help them develop this land. The sheik told them to take those moors because they're not going to do anything. Whoa, I mean, you know, that's saying a lot of things. This is a direct reference to the Treaty of Peace and Friendship between Morocco and the U.S. They asked for permission, just like with the Treaty of Fort Wayne, 30 million acres gone. Oh, we're going to speak for you. We're going to give you permission to take these acres of land. We're going to give you, you hijacks permission to come over here. We're going to give you permission to settle here and take the title of America. You can read about it, man. Read more about it. Look how proud they are of it. Just like the hijack is proud of the Treaty of Fort Wayne. This is no different than this. They're proud of it. This is the first page of the Moroccan Treaty of 1787. Thomas Jefferson and Benjamin Franklin worked closely with the Moors. Oh, yeah. We, we love these, the great white fathers of, of Washington <laughs> in the continent continental congress to secure this treaty they worked so hard with benjamin franklin we're so proud of that because we're a part of this we're a part of this thing look how they happen to be a part of it in the bevins collection there are over 200 letters to the bay of morocco from the continental congress there were so many moors in the continental congress working with the european Masons originally taught by the moors they're just happy to teach these people they're so proud of these hijacks they're just so happy to claim that they educated them, taught by the Moors, to form a novus ordem seclorum, new secular order of the ages, a new world order. We were a part of it. Come on, man. Out of many peoples and nations, da, da, da. the Moroccan treaty is very powerful because according to the Constitution, here we go again, treaties are the law of the land. So this is how they negotiate within constitution was just really a hijack you know saying from you know the cons you know what i mean and how the cons were you know we had our own confederacy tecumseh was leading that in this time dragon canoe was leading the real spill in this time how do we know that there were that there were the treaties that how do we know that where the treaty says more that so-called black people at that time is being referred to and they go into proving themselves. But this is their prophet, the prophet of Moab, not Jacob, you know what I'm saying? Not Israel, not Asherah. This is their 
their prophet, leading them to the promised land and giving them a lot of connectivity they needed, you know, to survive a little longer in this crazy world. <laughs> but, uh, you know, what, what happens time and time again with Atlantis, man? Chaos. And then you look for a savior, but that don't come out of Atlantis. Oh, but he arrived in Arabia as an angel from Egypt. I'm talking Timothy Drew. All right, man. So he has all this connection, you know. I mean, you read about it, man. I'm done. I'm out of here, man. You read about it. I mean, I'm a, <laughs> you take your time and get through this. The Barbary Treaty, 1786. So you can really see why we all the way up. Here goes this Jefferson flow. And this is their treaty, right? This is their treaty <laughs> with the hijacks that are taking your titles of American, right? They just found you here. This is their treaty with them, okay? <laughs> we declare that both parties have agreed that this treaty consisting of 25 articles shall be inserted in the book and delivered to the Honorable Thomas Barclay. Now you got the... Now you got the Barclays Arena, the agent of the United States now at our court with whose approbation it has been made and who is duly authorized on their part to treat with us concerning all matters concerned. So here they go. They start popping off. If either party shall be at war with any other nation, with any nation whatsoever, the other party shall not take a commission from the enemy nor fight under their colors. So <laughs> if the hijack is stealing our babies and massacring our priests and slaying our villages they can't help us this is why when takum says he's trying to tribe them up push mataha is like i can't help you not even that he's like i'll see you on the battlefield they can't help us even today if the nations of israel kashara tribes of jacob right raise up right now according to their treaty they still couldn't help a knock out. They still would have to fall back and, you know, uh, play some type of, um, you know, some type of role, you know, some type of slick role in between. A lot of times we see our people elected to all these offices and these offices, they look like our people, but they're their people. You know what I'm saying? They, they play these intermediate roles. If either party shall be at war with any nation whatsoever and take a prize belonging to that nation, there shall be found on board subjects or effects belonging to the other parties. The subject shall be set at liberty. <laughs> so they get liberty throughout all this stuff. Effects return to the owners. And if any goods belonging to any nation with whom either the party shall be at war shall be loaded on vessels belonging to the other party, they shall pass free and unmolested without any attempt being made to take or detain them. You can't touch us. You can't touch us. They're talking about, you know, being at sea. And if we're men at sea, you know, you can't go to war with us. They just protect it to this day. You help us. We help you to this day. If an American citizen shall die in our country with no will, and no will shall, shall appear, the council shall take possession of his effects. And if there shall be no council, the effects shall be deposited in the hands of some person worthy of trust into the party. Shall so they, they're just super amitable, right? We got that in the beginning, amity. <laughs> if any differences shall arise by any party infringing on any of the articles of this treaty, peace and harmony shall remain notwithstanding in the fullest force until a friendly application shall be made for an arrangement and until the application shall be rejected no appeal shall be made to made 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 shall be made to arms so you can't go to war with us and if a war shall break out between the parties nine months shall be granted to all subjects of both parties to dispose of their effects and retire with their property and it is further declared that whatever indulges in trade and otherwise shall be granted to any of the Christian powers, the citizens of the United States shall be equally entitled to them. <laughs> whatever stuff you take, we are equally entitled to. Whatever indulges 
in trade or otherwise, like slavery, shall be granted to any of the Christian powers, the citizens of the United States shall be equally entitled to them. <laughs> That's them. They're, they're not talking about you. They're talking about now applied to the descendants of European, the citizens of the United States are now entitled to whatever they stole land, they can give it to their people now. They can just pass it on to their descendants. In Managa, this is perpetual, like the Papa Bull 1452, Doom diverses, be kicking. We're just talking about the more. I told you, man, we're going to get some of this uh, 2017. We're going to go back a little bit, get a few minutes out of this. <sighs> We're going to come back in 87, you know, talk some more of this to come say push my you know what I mean? This Fort Wayne Treaty, you know, and again, that led to all this Dansville, Moorville, you know, you still got this Dansville, Phineas and Ferb <laughs> happening, you know, free Phineas, man, and, you know, my nog is popping off, so let's get a little bit of this, man, for the dismount. Let go. This was a colony of this barbarian situation. This north, uh, you know, saying west Morocco. This this situation here colonized that situation here. This was West Africa because they considered this West Africa a West colony of their colony here. The goat. And I say, well, who gave you this one world empire? Moab. Oh, Moab, I mean, Moab, you're doing treaties, Moab. Transfer of inheritance to the Moors of North. A Maxim. Where do we see this in Maxim? You see this in Mexico. Noble Drew Ali. He just said the dominion of a Mexican, the first and true divine name of Africa. Well, well. We're talking about North Mexico. So we're talking about North Africa, North America. So they want Africa and America. I mean, all that belongs to Moab, right? North Cape. Remember, this was signed by Zelia S. Bay, excuse me, Zelia S. L. Bay L. L. All right. Aboriginal, Indigenous, National, Moorish, American. Harris, Empress, Moabite. We caught this a long time ago, this Moabite. Why is there a Moabite here? We're talking about something signed in the 14th thing. Uh, and it looked like it was updated in 2010. Or we just talking the same year. Was this just re-signed or done literally in 2010, man? Let's go. What's going on in 1430, so-called Negro? See, if you don't know who you are, you's probably on the other side of this. You know what I'm saying? We have your cousins that look just like you, but yeah, they're not you. So they benefit off of your ignorance and they do treaties for who? Moab, for land and resources at latitude, longitude, 41, da, 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 da. all this Connecticut, you know what I'm saying? We got all this area, this, this East Coast area that they're getting, Zillia SL signing as a Moabite transferring inheritance. She's protected under all this. Oh, the, the Zodiac Constitution protects the United States Republic Department of Justice. Mm -hmm. United States Supreme Court Supreme Laws protecting them. This transfer involves her unalienable, inalienable, secure rights as a Moorish American national, secure under all these declarations, executive orders. Remember Tripoli. Remember the Barbary, Barbarian Treaties, 1786 Treaty of Peace and Friendship. We'll get more of this later, November 4th, 1796. 
to your peace and friendship side of triple B. Right? There is firm and perpetual peace and friendship between the United States Corporation and the bang. They are subjects at Tripoli Barbary Balance Bay made by the free free consent of both parties and guaranteed by the most potent day in Regency of Algiers. If goods belong to any nation with which either of the parties is at war shall be loaded on board any vessels belonging to the other party that shall pass free. So if the corporation went to war against you, they have to go with it. Mm. They couldn't go against it. By going against it, they're violating the treaty of peace and friendship between them and the corporation. So they only exist in the corporation. They get their power from the corporation. Sure, Morocco predates this corporation, but they still get their power because this corporation took over. We saw paper. Mm. We saw paper. Uh oh. I mean, my man Uno dropping about that boule. Oh no. So we're getting this out of, you know, the Emerald Tablets of Thought. You said, Tap it one. You got the links, pull it up. Let's He's go. talking about Atlantis. No, but you at least talking about Atlantis. Let's go. He's talking about the Moabites from Atlanta, Moab. Uh, uh huh. Receive permission from the parents to sell it in. Right, so these Moabites, the dominion and habitation extended from northeast and southwest Africa across Great Atlantis, even unto present North, South, and Central America, and also Mexico, Mexico, and the Atlantis Islands before <laughs> the earthquake, which caused the Great Atlantic Ocean. Oh, yeah. Noble <laughs> Drew Lee know a lot about Atlantis. Noble <laughs> Drew Lee speak Atlantis very well. Pop off, drop. He knows about the unnavigable waters when this sunken island sunk. He is sure he knows about this island, you know, this, this land that connected Australia to India. Lemuria from Australia to the other side of America. There's more land, more land, more land sunken all over the place. All over the place. So this brother Noah do Noble do Ali, you know what I'm saying? I mean, this is their prophet. He, he, he's bringing in, he's reestablishing their law. He's reestablishing Thoth. He's reestablishing Moab. He is a prophet to Moab. Is he a prophet to Israel? He's a prophet to Moab. He's a prophet to Canaan. Is he a prophet to Israel? And if Moab exists and Canaan exists, surely the sons of Jacob and daughters of Jacob exist. Surely we do. We just don't know who the hell we are. We're called Negro. We accept it because we don't have that family connection. All of our chiefs have been destroyed. But they had their chiefs. They had their chiefs. So we'll get back into this thing with Ali. Saying, you know, we started with this Exodus, we're talking about the flood. Let's go right here. And the right hand of Aya Aya Awa. It's become glorious in power. Thy right hand, Awa, that dashed in pieces the enemy. Ah, the enemy was dashed in pieces. And in the greatness of thy excellency, thou hast overthrown them that rose up against thee. Thou sentest forth thy wrath, which consumed them as stubble. And with the blast of thy nostrils, the waters were gathered together. The flood stood upright as in heat, and the depths were congealed in the hearts of the sea. The enemy said, I will pursue, I will overtake, I will divide the spoil. My lust shall be satisfied upon them. I will draw my sword, my hand shall destroy them. Thou didst blow, thou didst blow with the wind. The sea covered them. They sink as lead in the mighty water. Cut, cut, cut. They sank as lead in the mighty water. They sank as lead in the mighty water. They cut, cut. Wind. Barbarian. Set up shop, thought vibration. He says he gave him soul force. <laughs> Raised them up to do what? 
go against the indigenous. Now they have an army hopping with Columbus coming over here talking about they discovering something. Mm. Dark Portuguese, dark swarthy Spaniards. Pop off, drop. Moorish Columbus. <laughs> but more means great. But they came to conquer the greatness, the greatness so that the name of Israel will be in remembrance no more. No more. So that's <sighs> Go get that drop, man. We've been dropping, man. 2017, five years ago. Don't act like we on some new newness and some new play play. My balcony surface already know what it is. We ain't changed up. We ain't switched up. We still on the same path, deciphering. And it's getting, you know, realer and realer. No matter how many times they try to stop what we're doing, we just keep getting realer, man. And that's why I appreciate Val all of you in real time and um honestly that's why we're here man you know that's why we made it this far you know they keep looking you know every time i look at this map and they connect this con ka you know you see this con ka key river it seems to be an important demarcation of what's happening with this harmonic situation and next time we'll talk more about it i'll just leave you with these links right here man with some of this con key history and you know click the links below you can get it you know dredging of the con key river in the great grand con you know that's what it looks like grand con right <laughs> what does this grand con key have to do with the grand con right prior to 1852 the grand con key marsh was the largest wetland area in north america this is a serious place largest wetland in North America, the size of the marsh of a wetland was 500,000 acres of wetland. But because of these damn dams, man, this vast area had wildlife, man. Oh, it drew all these hunters, Benjamin Harrison. Oh, here comes these Harrisons again. 1854, the process of draining the marsh had approval from the government. And by the 1880s, they were underway with the creation of drainage districts. They started jamming up the water. Damn, damn, steam, steam, shovels, and dredges were brought into the canal to channel out the big ditches to the water, to the river. The process continued until 1911, and the marshes was mainly dry. Now, the dredges were then brought in the channel to the Kankakee River, so they orchestrated this, right? <laughs> By 1917, 250 miles of bayous and marshes and sand islands had been reduced to 90 miles of straight river. So the straight river 90 mile thing is artificial. They dredged out 500,000 acres, man. <laughs> the dredging started near South Bend and continued to Indiana, Illinois state line, the Grand Marsh which had been the largest wetland in North America was reduced to approximately 30,000 acres from fit from 500,000 to 30,000. <laughs> now they want to act like they have restoration efforts. Okay. You know, read some more about the Concord key, you know, this Britannica drop, you know, and it's going to start connecting some things, you know what I'm saying? I mean, specifically, you know, I mean, you're in Indiana, you're connected to Illinois, you know what I mean? You know, the Potawatomi Indians, you know, are settling in this area. We got this, you know, with the Confederacy flow. And, you know, it's, it seems to have a lot to do with this migration pattern that somebody's taking. I mean, they, they're literally changing the flow of the rivers. I mean, I'm just leaving you some links. You know, we're going to start on these and take our time with them next time. But these Kankakee city, County towns vanished. So, yes, this damn damn situation caused the vanishment of these towns, of certain towns. Some of the, what does it say? Uh, if you look closely at the old map of Kankakee County, you'll find the names of a number of places that no longer exist. Some of these were tiny rural post offices bearing the names such as Reynoso and Limest 
Limestone Township or Yellowhead Center. Others were Flagstaff Railroad Station, such as Tucker. I mean, so here we go with these damn dams, and here we go with these cities now that don't exist or are now underwater. You have the town of Judson popping off. You got Danville, like we just mentioned, and Danville is also right there on the map, right? Look at that. Under the Holy Mountain, you got Danville. Come, come. So we're looking at how, you know, these things are, you know, <laughs> Danville, right? <laughs> Somehow disappears too. Judson wasn't ready to concede defeat. However, there still was an issue of the town would be awarded. All right. So <laughs> as we pop off, we got the Kankaki Torrent. The Kankaki Torrent was a catastrophic flood. So <laughs> what type of waters are we dealing with with this flood in these towns that are disappearing that occurred about 19,000 years ago? Now, come on. Now we're going crazy, right? <laughs> 19,000 years, man. I'm out of here, man. I'm on daddy daycare. But now we got an ice sheet, right? Now we got this whole situation. It's lowering tide. Now you're back to the glaciers and you're just talking Kankaki. And they just went back 19,000 years to talk Kankaki, my noggin. And a catastrophic flood. So, you know, we're talking something interesting, man. We'll be back in it. You know what I'm saying, man? We're just talking Kankaki. And I'll leave this for you lastly the Kankaki River yesterday and today. And this is going to actually give us some good geological drop, you know what I'm saying, to really understand you know, what they've done, you know what I'm saying, how this damming up and dredging up the place, and, you know, they still got politics going on to this day. I mean, task force appointed governor of Illinois 1977 had reviewed the material then available and had talked to area residents about their concerns, so they still got concerns, man. So this is going to give us a lot of drop on the Kankaki Basin as well and just why it was so important, you know what I mean, when you dug on um, you know, digging on this migrations and the Grand Con. Here we go again, the Grand Con Key March National Wildlife. So imagine the beauty, the paradise, the wildlife that was popping off with these 500,000 acres of wetlands. You know what I'm saying? Just imagine the wildlife that was popping off. You know what I mean? Then you got the Con Ka River Torrent. And remember the Con Ka is like the Ganja, and the Ganja is the Ganges, and you got this river of paradises. So you got these different torrent rivers, you know what I mean, going all the way up. But the Kanka, the Ganja, and the Kanka key seem to be really the key <laughs> to the mystery, man. This is the Presta Hour. You've been surfing the wave in the Press their investigation installment number 86, my nigga, and we just popping off. And they have for all your comments, man. Keep leaving them, man. And you know, I'm gonna keep reading them <laughs> while I'm on daddy daycare, man. And John Paul, man, hey, hey hop to all y'all, you know what I'm saying. Yeah, man. I'm going to check him out, man. Uh, Henry Hubbard, uh, Hubert. Yeah. Yeah, definitely, bro. You know what I'm saying? All this is coming together <laughs> in real time. So keep leaving your comments. And we just popping off. Hey, legend in Lafayette. I see you, man. I see you. Your Helene, your pioneer and prophecy. No knowledge the most. Not inspired. Yeah. Carmel is in you, though. Uh, Leona Abbott. <laughs> It was always called Barack, and hey, we just popping off. Randy Hall, a hey, great ish is not a ish. <laughs> well, great ish is not a great. Hey, a wah wah, you know what I mean? Jaron Jones, Contessa Taylor, keep supporting Joy World. My noggins is still out there. This will fit you. Know what it is? Kanka Key. Oh, love to Shantae. That's what I wanted to say. He said I had to look something up. The area of Kanka Key was inhabited by the Potawatomi beginning. Sometime in the 18th century, Kankaki was founded in 1854. All right, he's just started dropping drop on it, which got me dropping drop, you know what I'm saying? But they connect with the Algonquin, Mississippi, Ojibwe, Council of Three Fires. These are all things we got to search for 
we search for the prester because the prester is the priest and we're talking about the priest kings we're talking about the chiefs right the council of three fires this was their alliance and next time we'll get back into that you know council that uh Tukum say and push mataha is having and now we'll get deeper into these treaties and how it was affecting the vibration and you know we couldn't tribe up because of it we couldn't tribe up because of it love to the bro shante man that was a great comment jda aos man yeah get the backup channel i'm gonna leave it below make sure you're here because this channel got already two you know, jabroni strikes on it, man. So we got to make sure we in there. She says, uh, yeah, the water for understanding. Anyway, thank you for the link drop. Nation got my heart bone, man, because we do it for my nagas from the heart bone, man. You know, from the heart bone. And we've been dropping, man. <clears throat> You're going to see us drop, you know, small little droplets, <laughs> small little drops. And those are the ones that we're going to start monetizing, trying to raise money for Joy World. But on the full ones, you know, we never monetize those. So you see the full presters or any full drops, we don't monetize. You know, a lot of this, we don't monetize. <laughs> you see a couple of monetizations. And as, other than that, you barely see any over here. Um, you know what I mean? I, we're one of the few, you know what I'm saying? <laughs> ones that really came for that heart bone, man. You know what I'm saying? Um, you know, one of the few ones left, you know, that really came really for the heart bone. We didn't treat YouTube as a business, you know. Like I said, we're going to start monetizing some just to see if we can, you know, do fundraisers, maybe go live more and do belly flop fundraisers and raise money for Joy World. But that wasn't at all what we started. You know, that has nothing to do with our, our process here. It has not been monetization. You know what I'm saying? Somebody could be eating, eating, eating off of this, but I don't like the advertisements. I don't like the um, you know, the interruptions, but, you know, excuse us as we do monetize some of the smaller, you know, clips that we do, you know, these are just the clips, you get the full joint first, and then we might drop clips and monetize those to raise money for Joy World. So look out for that. But at the same time, the full drops, you know, are going to be interruption free, man. So the water for my nagas surfing the wave, leaving great comments and keep surfing the wave, man. Press the 85 and beyond, you know what I'm saying? <laughs> Keep uh, enjoying the links, enjoying the flow, and everything we're doing, my nag, is for you, you know? Everything we're doing is to remember that we started somewhere. You know, to know we started somewhere, you know that we got a checkpoint to reach, you know what I'm saying? <laughs> we started somewhere, man, and now we got a checkpoint to reach, man. And we'll be back in the races of men. We were back in this races of men talking about how unique you are, my naga, how they found nothing like you. Even the apes were different. Even the apes of the old world, come on. Come on. It's a body back for the illusion. Let's go. And we impressed the John 83. All you're going to get is body bags <laughs> on body bags. Big Fred. So you got to keep the water flowing. Hey. Hey, uh, and I'm going to get more into your comments next time as well. We're going to we gonna enjoy. We're surfing the wave. We're making a victory lap. Press the John 85, my nugget. Keep surfing the wave, man, and dodge all hijacks. And I definitely want to find some drop on Yushi. So if you got some drop on Yushi, drop it, my nugget. Drop it for the cons. Drop it for the tribe. And hey, we back in here popping off. Get up in the drop chat. Chat to chat, chat it. And drop your drop. Hey, Shalawam, Elia King, Melvin, what it do? This is where we at now, man. We surfing the wave. Keep your vibe up. Stay up. Suit up. Tribe up.